Mighty Number no. 9 is a retro-style platformer developed by the creator of Mega Man and which was kickstarted by the fans, among whom I do not count myself because I didn't even play Mighty Number no. 1 through Mighty Number no. 8. And my goodness, this game seems to have pissed in a lot of people's hand sanitizer. The word mismanaged has been floating around a lot, but then this is the rule more than the exception with popular kickstarted projects. Say what you like about big publishers, but at least their drones have to demonstrate a degree of professionalism before they can donate their souls to the mothership, whereas the only guarantee with a kickstarted project is that lots of people want it, or at least claim to want it. In my experience, most people don't really know what they want. Want. A lot of people said they wanted Britain to leave the EU, but were quickly rethinking their position after the country was taken over by a character from Sesame Street, and the value of the pound dropped like a conservative prime minister's trousers at a pig farm. Between Mighty No. 9 and Broken Age, people really need to stop massively overfunding these things, because you don't keep a life raft afloat by throwing huge bags of coins at it. Personally, I've never taken an interest in behind-the-scenes drama when the end product is all that matters, so you can be assured of an unbiased review, because I'm a stingy asshole who wouldn't kickstart his dad's life support machine. And I'm not huge on Mega Man, but I do like a nice hard game, because Mother used to make me self-flagellate with a spiked paddle every time I had a sinful erection, and now it's the only way I can get off. In a cartoony sci-fi world, just barely legally distinct from that of Astro Boy, a case of sentient domestic and industrial robots have all been equipped with destructive weaponry out of some slightly misguided application of the Second Amendment. All of them suddenly malfunction for mysterious reasons and turn against humanity, requiring the one remaining non-evil robot, Beck, to defeat them all and inject them with personality repellent so they can go back to being unpaid slaves for a decadent and ungrateful human race. Beck has a lady robot friend named Call. Beck and Call, you see, where in Mega Man they're called Rock and Roll. An intentional juxtaposition, perhaps, between the language of submission and a musical genre associated with youthful defiance. No, of course it fucking isn't, it's a gossamer thin pretense of being a distinct entity from the Mega Man franchise, which the game can barely summon the effort to hold up. I quickly found myself wondering what people find so offensive about Revolution No. 9. Yes, it has the graphics of a high-end PS1 era game, and all the characters have the look of Kinder Surprise toys and about half the animation, but the last few Mega Man games were made with NES graphics, so the fanbase clearly care even less about technological relevance than they do about laundering their t-shirts. I still say that no game these days has any excuse for having a live system, because I place a clear distinction between a game that supplies an enjoyable meaty challenge and one that merely fucks the player about, and forcing me to restart the whole level from scratch because I died three times to an unreasonable pixel-perfect instant death jump to which I was given 12 nanoseconds to react very firmly pitches its tent in the fucking me about camp. But again, like a vast majority of kickstarted projects, nostalgia runs through Mambo Number no. 5 like whiskey through a recently deposed Prime Minister, and this just makes the game all the more faithful to its roots, and the age-old flaws that the nostalgia crowd don't see because they willfully poke themselves in the eyes with their own excited stiff face. I suppose the dialogue's pretty annoying, and just refuses to go away like an obnoxious uncle who came over for the holidays and is still there on January 3rd fucking the family dog. It's got voice acting straight out of a Saturday morning cartoon series about the importance of friendship with household appliances, and if I could claw back all the brain cells this game wasted thinking of new ways to tell me that I have to fight the enemies, I'd have enough to think of a funnier way to end this sentence. This was particularly annoying during the boss fight of the first mission because I learned swiftly that his voice lines were giving away what attacks he was about to use. That's American military engineering for you, I suppose. But when I got him down to half health, I couldn't hear his voice lines for a bit because my instructor had decided that now was the perfect time to remind me that I needed to fight the enemies. And with his subtitle and big stupid face concealing part of the arena, my little robot body was promptly taught some of the more advanced yoga positions. If I put my mind to it, I could come up with at least one major annoyance for every part of the game. In the power plant level, for example, the game only thought to tell me about the crouch dash move the moment after I was murdered by the pixel perfect insta-kill trap where I was supposed to use it for the first and as far as I know only point in the game. In the underwater level, the water looks like Keith Richards pissed in it, so the visibility is really obnoxiously poor for no apparent reason, unless a rogue level designer covered the walls in medical diagrams of diseased vaginas and no one could be bothered to take them down. And there's another level that takes place entirely in a corridor, again for no apparent reason. A very long, boring, repeated corridor. And to cement its candidacy for Overwatch-style most obnoxious play of the game, it's deliberately got no checkpoints. Perhaps it was intended as some kind of on-the-nose metaphor for kickstarted game development. A long, arduous, inescapable journey full of monsters throwing deadly coins at your head, and every now and again you get insta-killed because your community manager said something dumb on the internet. All in all, I felt very little motivation to continue playing when I could have been doing the laundry or waxing my arsehole, but I still don't think it's that atrocious a game, just not as rewarding as ripping the hairs out of my taint, and frankly few things are. It could be that the Mega Man fans are down on it because it's not so much a suck session as a re-session. Mega Man is an old and venerable empire of sequels and spin-offs with decades of gameplay tweaks and innovations, but 9 is the loneliest number didn't so much bring something to the table as snatch a few dinner rolls from the buffet and hide under the stairs. Core Lummy, a boss with fire attacks, then a boss with ice attacks? I'd better get off this fucking roller coaster in case my nose gets nailed to the back of my skull. The main innovation, I think, is the dash move that allows you to absorb enemies with low health in return for small temporary boosts and nothing that you might actually need, such as more health or a set of magic insta-kill repelling pajamas. Mighty Number no. 9 is the classic victim of the hype perpetual motion machine to which Kickstarter the nostalgia ventures are inevitably fed. It committed its sins before it ever saw the light of day because the people who invested built it up too much and were inevitably disappointed when it didn't heal their leprosy or 
or travel back in time to assassinate Mecha Stalin. On its own merits, its only crime is being a mediocre game wearing the bra of a considerably better endowed one. You can either waste energy throwing its balled up tissues back in its face, or get over it and motorboat some cantaloupes instead. So with yet another typically quiet July stretching ahead of us like the long dusty road that connects two cesspools, let's take a look at some indie games exclusive to consoles, or as I like to call them, CLASS TRAITORS! I still miss those innocent days of the Xbox Live Summer of Arcade, when the Xbox 360 would break up the mid-year drought with a showreel of indie digitals like a rich man digging a paddling pool in his front yard for the local street urchins to play in, while he watches from his darkened living room window, sweating profusely. And for a moment this week, the spirit of Summer of Arcade returned when the X-Bone coughed up a spiritual successor to Limbo, the depressed, self-harming beach babe of the 2010 frolics. So let's take a look inside. Uh, sorry, I meant to say, let's take a look at Inside. And that's going straight onto my list of game titles that are needlessly awkward to Google, alongside Fuse and Wet and Dead or Alive Extreme 3, which is very awkward to Google if your girlfriend ever looks at your search history. Inside opens with a small child lost in a dark forest, and you are given the implied instruction to keep moving right until something tells you to stop. Nothing wrong with having a comfort zone, of course, but one could be forgiven for thinking at first glance that Playdead Studios have merely slapped a sporty red top onto the protagonist of Limbo and left it at that. It's an atmospheric puzzle platformer of the child lost in scary world genre that remains even after all these years the fast track to indie acclaim. You have a jump button and a pull things button and you will die like a Game of Thrones supporting actor demanding a salary increase. But while the similarity to Limbo remains stark, things feel a little different when you start getting chased by dogs and scary men with flashlights and we discover there's slightly more of a plot going on inside. I mean, in inside. Oh fuck it, I'm just gonna call it Thatcher's Britain from now on, alright? Where in Limbo you were an insignificant speck of interest to other characters only as two ounces of a tasty nutritious alternative to pork, there's definitely something a bit deeper going on in Thatcher's Britain if the authorities are chasing you with scary dogs. As we explore the city, we uncover a sinister society where a scientific elite exploit a case of what could be artificial humans or brainwashed humans or the living dead or Brexit voters. It's all kept in the background and open to interpretation. Your job is to keep moving past the interesting things and try not to get murdered by the interesting things. It's got a handful of new mechanics to puzzle your way around. Since Limbo, the protagonist's head has been reduced in size for improved buoyancy, so now you can actually swim. And there's a recurring mechanic in which you remote control some artificial Brexit voters that at certain points in the game start to make it feel like a somehow even bleaker Abe's Odyssey. But ultimately, none of it fully shakes off the limbo comparison, at least until the very last sequence of Thatcher's Britain. It is by no means a long game, and there are several elements one feels don't get a proper payoff. What was with that underwater baby thing with the 70s hairdo? What happened to that pig we hung around with? I thought we were getting along really well. But it's the last few minutes that most dominate my thinking when I go over Thatcher's Britain in my head, when the game takes the last exit to Bonkersburg. I very much don't want to spoil anything, but if you've ever fallen asleep while watching Children of Men and had that dream where you're being chased down a hallway by your father's disembodied testicles, it might seem weirdly familiar. A long journey on Unexpectedly turns into a few minutes of chaos and horror and abruptly stops in a way that feels simultaneously relieving and anticlimactic. It's like watching the never ending story up to one of the scary bits and then shooting yourself in the head. And honestly, I'm not even sure I'd recommend it. Certainly memorable and effective, but I left feeling more depressed than satisfied. Well, if they made Sex and the City into a film, there must be a market for depressing things. Anyway, Thatcher's Britain was only Expo exclusive for like a week before the Steam release, so let's move on to something that's still console exclusive as far as I know Shadow of the Beast on the PS4, a remake of a classic Amiga side scrolling beat em up. The usual line one takes with remakes is what's the point of remaking something that's already a classic, and happily that is a question that will come nowhere near this venture, because the original Shadow of the Beast was a load of old nobblers in which the principal activity was standing in one place mashing the punch button until everything stopped moving. So it's a perfectly sound idea to try the recipe again with maybe one less cup of diarrhea and one more cup of God of War. And so in Shadow of the Beast we are the titular beast who resembles a purple dude wearing a Pokemon on his head. We were created as a living weapon by an evil sorcerer, we break free of their control and proceed to murder our way through the sorcerer's minions to take up our list of grievances with the big baddie. So far so good, or rather so far so god of war. Where the game tries to evoke the game that inspired it is in the combat, which is very much in the spirit of keep pressing the punch button. Enemies approach in single file from in front and back, and most of them can be instant killed with one hit. What's the word for this strange feeling inside me, this cosy feeling of warmth and familiarity that makes me feel like I'm in precisely the place where I'm most comfortable? Oh, I remember. Hatred. I hate this combat system. Because it's one part combat to one part Parappa the Rapper. And when you activate Rage of the Gods, I mean frenzy mode, I mean I can't even remember what they called it, I can't be asked to look it up, it becomes entirely a rhythm game with pre-animated kills instead of music that I couldn't even look at because I had to focus entirely on the timed button prompts so my dude could have been befriending the enemies with piñata parties for all I know. What's more, every move you make locks you into an animation that you can't cancel out of, and like a threesome participant who drew the short straw, you have practically no defence against being stabbed from both sides. With time, however, I did find myself gradually getting 
getting the hang of the rather needlessly complex array of moves, blocks and dodges, it turns out that all along the best strategy was keep pressing the punch button, and went into the final boss fight with a wary confidence in my abilities. And then, joke upon joke, the final boss fight uses different gameplay altogether, like an engineering degree course that ends with a pie-eating contest. It becomes a Space Harrier jetpack shooter, and the original did something similar, but let's not forget that this was in a bygone, more experimental age, when game design involved throwing ideas up into the air and breaking out the elephant gun. The theme of this week's episode has been games that turn into something else towards the end, but while Thatcher's Britain somewhat gets away with it by being constantly vague, Shadow of the Beast seems to merely forget what it was supposed to be doing. At the start, the villains steal a baby, and we go after them in pursuit, but I don't think that baby's ever brought up again. A baby isn't something one can quietly drop. The last baby I dropped certainly isn't quiet. It's always inspiring to see the sub-triple-A sector lighting itself on fire and shooting for the stars. No retro pixel art or large-headed children in scary worlds for the Technomancer, oh goodness me, no! It's the Mass Effect and Deus Ex full-on action RPG club that it hopes to blag its way into with its dark glasses and suspiciously bulky trench coat. Have you characters, Technomancer? You bet your bollocks we've got characters, party members and quest givers every colour of the miserable bastard rainbow. With struggles and adversities you will invest in like a dot-com startup in the late 90s. Have you built us a world, Technomancer? You gamble your gonads we've built a world, a dark and complex cyberpunk world in which Factions battle for supremacy against the backdrop of post-colonization Mars, and there are only shades of grey. I ain't disputing that last part, Technomancer, but probably not in the way you intended. Now have you combat? You wager your wobbly bits we've got combat! Exciting real-time combat with enough variety of weapons and skills to create a staggering number of alternative playstyles. What number's that, Technomancer? Three! There's three playstyles. Hmm, that is quite a staggering number. Alright, I'm down. Why don't you start by telling me the main character's overall goal? I'll bugger, I knew we forgot something. For what it's worth, our hero is Zachariah Mansa, a Technomancer, because on future Mars, everyone's surname is their job, like a village of medieval serfs. We can customise his appearance, but it's not really worth the bother. You can't pick gender, and the available faces are a global showcase of conventional attractiveness. There's also no facial hair, like anywhere, even on the NPCs. Some people have stubble, but nothing that can't just be drawn onto the face texture with felt tips, so I guess we know precisely where the 3D modelling budget ran out. Anyway, our story begins with Zacky Boy, graduating from the Technomancy school of his home city on Mars. The Technomancers are an exclusive and ever so slightly creepy order of mystics bound by vow to protect the secret of their mysterious power. What mysterious power, you ask? They can shoot lightning. That's it. Doesn't seem worth making that much fuss about in a world that also has guns. You could out-equip a Technomancer with a gift certificate and ten minutes in an American shopping mall. And the big secret you're all vowed to protect is that Technomancers are technically mutants, the lowest case of Mars society, because aren't they always? This too doesn't seem worth making that much of a fuss about, and could probably lose all its impact with a few minor societal reforms. I mean, one suspects mutants are only an underclass because they're such ugly motherfuckers and the Technomancers all look like various incarnations of Robert Patrick, but it's Zachariah's devotion to keeping this secret that earns him the ire of the evil ruling authority. Once the graduation's over, Zack starts work as a peace officer working with the evil ruling authority, so while I was at that point about as engaged as a dad chaperoning his daughter to a One Direction concert, I figured I was obliged to at least play as far as the bit where we get framed and the sinister authority turns against us, which anyone with the majority of their brain still inside their skull could see coming. Any game in which you start as a member of a sinister authority who interacts with poor people and suspiciously attractive revolutionaries will almost certainly contrive you to be no longer a member of the sinister authority before the second act, with the exception of Modern Warfare shooters, where you usually stay in the sinister authority and French kiss assault rifles for six hours. It's the usual action RPG format, quest givers give you a place on the map to go to, you go to that place, talk to someone at that place, and occasionally they become so incensed by the audacity with which you go to places talking to people that you're forced to beat them and all their friends to death, in a Dragon Age-esque disorganised melee. There's the inevitable stealth option, but the stealth attack doesn't even kill the target, and it alerts everyone in the area anyway, so it's as much use as a handbrake on a shark. Otherwise I've seen worse combat. I went for club and shield specialisation because fuck it, let's just turn every game into Dark Souls. And here's my top tip, keep swinging and press block if the enemy dodges twice, because you'll get a free parry. Combat got really fucking boring after I figured that out, but the game compensates for that. Remember when I said it was building a dark and complex cyberpunk world? Well the emphasis was on dark. The graphics get so shadowy it's almost impossible to tell the human enemies and my party members apart. They're all silhouettes with no beards, and half the time it's difficult to tell whether they're winding up attack animations or checking themselves for prostate cancer. So getting back to that inevitable first act twist, it turned out I was giving too much credit when I predicted the evil authority would frame you for something before they do the big betrayal scene, or indeed that they'd show you the big betrayal scene. What happens is, two of Zack's mates intercept him on the way to work and say, hey, they're setting up the big betrayal scene in there, might wanna just piss off. And he takes their word for it. Blimey, those budget cuts hit everyone, don't they? Technomancer is certainly more at home to Trevor Tell than Siobhan show, and by Christ does it tell. Characters can't be said to converse in this game, they merely recite paragraphs of exposition vaguely in the direction of other people. And sometimes the game doesn't even get as far as the telling. Those two mates who warn you off from the betrayal pinata party, I'm prepared to swear that this was the first time we were meeting 
meeting one of them, but she's presented like we already know who she is. Maybe I hadn't paid enough attention because I was distracted cataloging all the metal wall textures. It's possible she was one of the NPC quest givers we met earlier. They were all fairly interchangeable. Dark clothes, boring voice, no beard. Whatever, betrayal allegedly occurs somewhere, presumably. And we're forced to flee the city to pursue our quest to... That's right, we never figured that out, did we? Well, there's some overarching thing about the Technomancers having the lifelong goal to re-establish contact with Earth, but that's more of a hobby, really, and even if they succeed, I failed to see how it would help. I don't see the scrappy survivalist communities of Mars crafting a space program out of radio parts and back issues of Top Gear magazine. All that we actually do is go from settlement to settlement, sorting out random issues and be the pigeon to the main villain's dick dastardly, who hounds us apparently out of having literally nothing else to do with his time. It's a shame, because accepting a few petty niggles, like the way Zachariah shuffles forward a few steps every time you try to stop moving, so getting in front of a small panel or dustbin to interact with is like keeping hold of a bar of soap in the bath, the game is technically functional. But it can't tell an interesting story for shit, and in an RPG that's 90% of the final grade. They failed to find the interesting story in a game about lightning wizards from Mars. That's like failing to find the homoerotic subtext in professional wrestling. July remains a rich month for indie games, because if you want to snag yourself some of the AAA Dragon's Horde of Plunder, probably best to do it when the dragon's all tired out from fucking me up the arse. So let's take a look at Fury, a game as unique as it is bad at spelling. I say unique, it very strongly reminds me of games like No More Heroes, Lollipop Chainsaw, God Hand and the like, but it's got no retro pixel art, no procedural generation, and large-headed children don't get within seven leagues of a scary world, which in today's indie circles makes it jump out like a tarantula in a filing cabinet. You play a mute albino Bob Marley lookalike who everyone refers to as Stranger. We never find out what his last name is, though, probably Dan Fiction, or Zin the Knight. As the game opens, he's being held at the top of a magic space prison, and in order to escape he must confront a series of colourful jailers and show them the true meaning of Stranger Danger. On the way we learn bits and pieces about who we are and the nature of our imprisonment from the enigmatic things stated by our enemies, and by an omnipresent pink man with the head of a cartoon rabbit who might not be real. It reminds me of that time I took ketamine right before a job interview. The original thought from which Fury seems to have developed is this. What if you took no more heroes and cut out everything but the boss fights with crazy weirdos? Well, first of all, you'd have a fucking short game, but you'd also not have wasted hours of your life running down corridors, murdering hundreds of random extras that are as much threat to you as a breadstick is to an industrial fan, and shopping for t-shirts, and would now have all those hours spared to do something constructive like stare at a wall or try to remember all the number one hits of the Spice Girls. Fury would suggest that perhaps you could use the time you saved to walk very slowly through some very pretty landscapes it designed, while a rabbit-headed man shows off his impression of Mark Hamill's Joker. I suppose it has to build up anticipation for the next boss fight somehow, but I wouldn't think it was possible for walking slowly along a fixed route to control like shit. It's probably because of the way the camera keeps switching from one crazy artful angle to the next, like my walk down the street to the newsagent is being directed by Alfred Hitchcock. But I guess these bits are vital for the story in that they leave you confused rather than completely bewildered. In the actual fights, you hack and perchance slash with your sword, but regardless I'd be loath to call the game a hack and slash when it also has many of the elements of a bullet hell shooter, such as bullets, shooting, and me yelling HELL! I totally fucking parried that, you asshole game! The challenge comes from a mixture of pattern memorization, accuracy, and pure reflexes, but with varying amounts of each from boss to boss, which rather keeps things interesting. It also means that the difficulty curve is all over the fucking place, and more resembles a line graph showing my level of emotion during an average episode of Flipper. The hardest fights were the second, and I think it was the seventh, but only because it had more stages than the fucking grieving process, and ended with a prolonged gauntlet of hazards that had to be dodged and it's hard to predict that the dodge move will put you where you want or send you right into a burly sailor carrying two pints of bitter. The last but one fight is really weirdly easy, but also not quite easy enough to be a subversive joke non-fight like the one in No More Heroes, and in any case Fury is so short a game that one boss is a significant chunk, and throwing it away for a joke seems wasteful, like voting for the Libertarians. Fury's combat gets a wee bit parry-centric in the second half, and it won't last you very long if you are a hard games connoisseur, but it's original enough to make it worth giving a chance, you stingy fuck, and that rather puts it in contrast to our second game, Song of the Deep, which probably isn't worth checking out, but if you've ever played Aquaria or Ori and the Blind forest, then good news, you've already checked out Song of the Deep. I hope that saved you some time, that wall ain't gonna stare at itself. It's small child scary world, but this time with a storybook approach similar in tone to Child of Light, but with the god-awful poetry replaced by a very earnest sounding narrator with an Irish accent, and during the intro sequence a little voice in my head went, order oh, always after me lucky charms Bigora, and I'm ashamed to admit I made myself laugh. It's the story of a little girl who lives a simple life with her fisherman father, but when he fails to return from the sea one day she builds a submarine. Okay, I'm not gonna let you gloss over that, Song of the Deep. How does a prepubescent girl whose education consists of reading the labels on the back of her dad's whiskey bottles construct a functioning deep submergence vehicle? It's not like a boxcar derby, you silly moo. Whatever, she goes out to sea to drag her deadbeat dad back from whatever mermaid bordello he's presently drinking dry. It's a Metroidvania game in about the most boring way possible. All paths are locked off until you find the specific upgrade in the fixed linear sequence of upgrades that opens them, so you might as well just follow the objective markers one by one. Full disclosure, I stopped playing halfway through because I encountered a bug in a narrow passage, which is the worst possible 
possible way to experience buggery. I'd acquired the ability to leave the sub to explore narrow passages, but one time when I did this the sub somehow glitched inside the passage and I couldn't get it out again. And since I'd found a collectible in the passage, the game very helpfully autosaved over the only save slot available. Which does rather raise the question of why this game has fucking save points if it's just gonna save wherever it likes. Maybe the save points are for refilling your health and energy meters, but wrong! Your health and energy regenerate anyway, that's probably why the gameplay is about as engaging as pissing in the kitchen sink. So after it bugged out, I said to myself, would I rather restart the game or spend the afternoon circumcising myself with the edge of a rusty tin? The fact that I'm debating this at all will probably suffice as the review. One thing I did get to see was generic boss fight 36 Gamma, Giant Spider. Leaving aside the question of what the fuck's a giant spider doing at the bottom of the sea, the answer being not a whole lot, the boss seemed to be having tremendous difficulty posing any kind of threat. Any time I ventured close, all it could do was wrap me up in web and then let me go, whereby I escaped from all but instantly. It wasn't a fight so much as a mutual mild annoyance, and I think this encapsulates my main issue with Put Me To Sleep. It feels totally condescending. Between the gameplay that's unchallenging in every sense of the word, and the narrator who talks like a nursery school teacher praising a child for sticking crayons up their nose and sneezing on craft paper, perhaps that should have been my hint that I'm not the target audience for this game, but cast your eye on the developer. Yes, it's Insomniac Games! Ratchet and Clank, Resistance, Sunset Bloody Overdrive. What's a AAA developer doing making 2D small child scary world games? This isn't Secret Millionaire! And that's what's really condescending, that they thought they'd come down from on high to show the indies how it's done, and made something so insultingly generic. Stick to the likes of Sunset Overdrive, lads. It's easy to stick to, cause it's covered in shit. I am Setsuna, in my lucrative side venture as a transvestite cam whore, but by strange coincidence, I am Setsuna is also the name of a game that came out last week. It's a JRPG, because with a title like that, of course it was going going to be either a JRPG or a visual novel about an innocent young schoolmate and all the ways you can fuck her on a subway train. According to the Steam page, the game purports to be inspired by the timeless classic Chrono Trigger, with no apparent pun intended, and I was down for that because Chrono Trigger was a game from the SNES period of actually tolerable JRPGs before they became overwritten, overdesigned claptrap, full of interchangeable characters who have to get up at three in the morning to be properly dressed for dinner. Sadly, I Am Setsuna hasn't taken inspiration from any part of Chrono Trigger that mattered, such as the unique character's imaginative plot that develops in interesting ways or variety of environments with more than two colours and merely recreates the combat and party mechanics somewhat faithfully. Which is like claiming that your movie is inspired by Apocalypse Now because you also recorded it on film and employed sound engineers and pointed your camera at a fat bloke for ten minutes. The plot of I Am Henry VIII I Am is that the titular Setsuna has been nominated to sacrifice herself to calm down all the world's monsters or something, and has to make the difficult journey to the sacrifice shop because it never occurred to anyone to put on a fucking bus service, and a party of adventurers assembles to protect her on the way. I'd like to take a moment to draw your attention to one of the user-defined tags that was attached to this game on Steam. Story rich. I take slight issue with it because you don't get story rich just from mugging Final Fantasy X in an alleyway and nicking their wallet. Final Fantasy X itself is only story rich in Zimbabwean dollars. Thankfully, I am Setsuna only nicks the pilgrimage plot device and not the rest of Final Fantasy X's plot, and the player character, as far as I know, isn't a ghost footballer from the future. Which brings me to the second user tag I want to bring up female protagonist. An outright stinking lie! Because the player character is a mercenary who becomes Setsuna's guardian. Setsuna's the important one, yes, and you can rearrange the party to put Setsuna in the vanguard if you feel you need a human shield, but it's still the mercenary whose dialogue we choose when we make the recurring vital decision between agreeing with Setsuna or slightly sarcastically agreeing with Setsuna. Perhaps there's an argument to be made that the playable character needn't necessarily be the protagonist of the story, but if I'm honest, I don't want Setsuna to be the protagonist because she's wetter than a fishing trip to Seattle. Part of my disdain for JRPGs is that most of them read from the same cast list of stock characters, the angsty taciturn hero, the scarred veteran warrior who calls himself past it because he's in his late twenties, and the pure and innocent girl who urinates lightly sparkling spring water and thinks a dildo is a character from Lord of the Rings. Setsuna's so fucking sweet and forgiving she gives me ice cream headache, but there's a point where we go beyond naively trusting into the realms of mental handicap. When she insists on you joining her party, the only thing she knows about you is that you're a hired killer, specifically hired to kill her. Oh player San, I feel so comfortable around your upraised dagger and coppery stench of blood money. I made myself laugh again by imagining Setsuna meeting a rabid grizzly bear. Oh I just know there's goodness in your heart Mr. Tufty. Rawr mole mole! So I wasn't sure if I was going to review Ichby 9 Berlina, so I said to myself, maybe I'll just play up to the end of the snowy area with the repetitive sad piano music and see how I feel. But the joke was on me, cause turns out that was the whole game! Which reminds me of another Steam user tag I take issue with, Great Soundtrack. Exhibit Q in the ongoing case for standardised sarcasm quotes. It's a soundtrack produced by a hotel pianist locked in a studio for 18 hours with a hockey mask on to stop him chewing his own hands off. Your ongoing task is to show up at a settlement and solve whatever issue prevents you from proceeding to the next one, which usually involves acquiring a new party member. So keep talking to NPCs until you find one whose name we are invited to change, if it really matters to us that our adventuring 
party consists entirely of people named after breakfast foods. This process also involves a lot of combat with weirdly adorable monsters. You encounter groups of reject beanie babies knocking about in the overworld, and you can get the surprise attack if you run into them before they notice you. But you have to have one foot in their breakfast burrito before they notice you, so why would you ever not get the surprise attack? The combat is like most televised news media in that it has something of a balance issue. Setsuna's claim on the protagonist title gets shakier by the minute because she's supposed to be the healer, and the player character gets a low-cost full-party heal spell early in the game. Admittedly, it's only full-party heal if everyone's standing next to each other, but they usually are. It's turn-based combat. Strategy straight from Rock'em Sock'em Robots. On top of that, several other characters have attacks that also inexplicably dole out full-party heals if you use the special sort of quick-time event but not really power-up thing that grants additional effects. So with only three slots for active party members, Setsuna can spend the game in my back pocket frantically jilling herself off with the neck of a potion bottle for all I care. I'm wondering why I'd want to use any of the squishy magic-focused characters when the others all have perfectly good magic attacks as well as useful standard attacks and can take hits without immediately folding up like a hotel room ironing board, except you never know when some plot development will force you to use them for a while and leave you facing the fuzzy horde five levels behind and armed with a spoon. The monsters do their bit for the lack of balance too. Most of the random encounters are completely trivial until once in a while one of them gets off that one spell that ups all their stats and they proceed to turn you into a pulled pork sandwich. And then there are the optional elite enemies, which are distinguishable from the others only by their different colour, which doesn't count for much since half the enemies in the fucking game are palette swaps of older ones, and by the fact that the moment you enter the fight they fucking pound you into the coleslaw that came with the pulled pork sandwich. You know what, I almost felt bad about complaining that the entire game is one big ice level, not every game has to be a fucking sightseeing tour, and maybe it wanted to focus on something else, until I was looking for tips for a certain boss and realised I had no idea what to fucking Google. Ice caves boss? That narrows it down to roughly all of them. Besides, if the game was focusing on something else, what the fuck could it have been? The emotional impact of Setsuna's tragic inspirational story? I got more emotional parting ways with my fucking yeast infection! It's early August, No Man's Sky doesn't kick off the pre-Christmas release schedule till the 9th, and I'm finding blood in my urine, so you know what that means, I've undergone severe kidney damage. And it's time for another indie double bill, this time with a bit of a retro sci-fi theme as we kick off with Headlander, a game by Double Fine in which you play as a disembodied head that flies around and lands on things. So at least the title's not as misleading as Day of the Tentacle, which I thought was going to be a documentary on the origins of Japanese fetish porn. In Headlander, you wake up in the far future to find that most of your body has gone walkabouts, and yet you're still the most intact organic life form in the universe, as everyone else has been digitised and put in robot bodies. Then, through no conscious effort on your part, you become involved with a resistance movement against a sinister overlord so that the human race can win back the right to their organic bodies and the freedom to get verrucas and Alzheimer's disease and poo their pants. I want to know if there's any option to go back and forth. Sure, I'll take the organic body for my afternoon wank, but I wouldn't mind being a giant robot tarantula when the time comes to help someone move. All of this is presented through a 70s sci-fi aesthetic. There's even a shootout to the sound of Joan Baez's song from the Silent Running soundtrack, and Christ knows how many players they expect to get that. There's also a comedic tone, which is not quite the same thing as being funny. I do sympathise with with Double Fine, they've made their name with funny games, so they clearly feel an obligation to keep the same tone going. But in Headlander, an obligation is precisely what it feels like. Yeah, there's some humour value in the very Douglas Adams-esque joke wherein the turrets have personalities and apologise every time they fire, but by the 300th apology, the titters have become very saggy. The point I'm desperately groping for, like the tissue box during my vinegar strokes, is that the plot and setting aren't inherently funny the way, say, Psychonauts were, so it doesn't feel like a comedy game so much as a game with way too many comic relief characters. Like a production of Henry IV with 17 full staffs. And now I've raised the intellectual tone of this review a bit, let's talk about blowing up robots with lasers. Headlander is a Metroidvania game where the core premise is that you can detach your head and stick it on different bodies to acquire different abilities and access different areas. Thematically not dissimilar to the body swapping mechanic in Double Fine's earlier game, Stacking, which makes me wonder if we've inadvertently discovered Tim Shaper's fetish. I had to play the game in short bursts because I found it rather boring, and it's not any one thing that brings it down. Progress is locked off by a linear sequence of colour-coded doors rather than any organic movement ability, and in combat the rooms can get so filled with enemy lasers that it overloads the senses. But if the enemies shoot your current body enough to blow it up, you can easily nick one of their so I might as well not even bother to dodge or move or play the game at all, and what the fuck am I still doing here? I've got laundry to do. The game has a bit of the simulated retro computer effects indie games seem to like so much these days, and the enemy robots make glitched out noises as they die, which is all very well, but I was having issues with frame rate and audio stutter and I was two hours in before I realised that they weren't supposed to be part of the aesthetic. In brief, nothing specifically kills it, but nothing made me particularly moist either. What a perfectly milk toast point to make for the exact middle of this video. Let's talk about something I did like instead, Quadrilateral Cowboy. Not to be confused with Quantum Conundrum, which is isn't actually that similar, but they'd be very close together on my Steam list if I hadn't bought all the Quake expansions. I picked Quadrilateral Cowboy basically at random from the Steam new releases because I was two days to deadline and midway through a Domestos binge, but I'll be blinded by household chemicals if I didn't find myself enjoying it. You'll swiftly notice that it's got a title that doesn't really mean anything, a very disjointed interpretive storyline with no dialogue, and an art style wherein everything looks like it's made of old cereal boxes, including the characters, since it's a game by the 30 flights of loving people and these are the things you just have to accept from such, like the cloying sense of disappointment and shame that Americans will feel after they vote this November. The game's setting is sort of like 
like steampunk except with retro computers instead of steam, which I guess needs a name. DOS punk? CRT punk? Pentium punk? So nerdy my underpants are spontaneously wedging themselves punk. You are a member of a small team of hackers and your job is to use VR to plan a series of heists against the man, man. Pretty much the same premise as volume, thinking about it, except the main character is a serial box rather than a liberal arts graduate in their parents' basement and with the generic stealth replaced by an actually interesting mechanic. You have to solve problems by programming your way around them with your portable DOS prompt, which starts off simple. You see a door, so you type door1.open and sit back awash with the pride of a newly blooded hunter, and by the end you're binding complex commands to a specific blink sequence so that you can remotely disable a laser grid at the precise moment your self-satisfied erection would have tripped it. It's a game about careful preparation rather than twitch reflexes. It specifically appeals to me because I've been known to code it up myself now and again, and there's something very satisfying about finding the quickest, most elegant solution. Or it could be that the mere act of typing my commands makes me feel like a hacker in a Hollywood film from the late 90s, as long as I crack my knuckles a lot and say tragically outdated things that a middle-aged screenwriter once heard on an episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. My major complaint is that there's just not enough of it, right? As enough mechanics have been added to the coding gameplay that it's starting to get interesting, the game drops it all for two missions where out of nowhere you solve puzzles with the old multiple iterations of yourself chestnut that in puzzle games in this day and age might as well be replaced by footage of a man saying etc etc while making a faintly masturbatory gesture with their wrist. The coding comes back later, but I never felt like there was a point where everything we had learned came together for one great climactic challenge before the game abruptly ends, in a and they all lived happily ever after now piss off sort of way. I like the core mechanic, but I get the impression the game's less interested in exploring it to the full as it is in pushing it through the, dare I say, ever so slightly pretentious storytelling elements. You want to make everyone look like Tupperware snowmen, that's your bag, but the story itself left me cold because the characters have unclear motivations and never experience much adversity. Gameplay is like a jar of peanut butter, it might be fun to stick your knob in, but kindly wait till after I've made the sandwiches. Yahtzee, please come out of the fridge. Has a big release come out? No. Did you bring me more lager? No. Well then piss off! Christ, I hate summer. All no games and nice weather and reasons to go outside. What about Abzu, Yahtzee? Oh yeah, Abzu, what do you want me to say? If you thought Journey and Flower didn't have quite enough marine biology for your taste, then here's the game for you. As long as you're badly misinformed as to what the word game means. Yahtzee, we both know you'd only get off the gaming couch if more than half of it was declared a nuclear disaster exclusion zone. You must have been playing something this week. Well, I did play a lot of Quake 1. There you go, tell us about that, from over there where we can't smell you. You're on like the two Johns! A few weeks back, the developers of the excellent Wolfenstein New Order marked the 20th anniversary of Quake 1 by releasing a free new level pack for the original game, which cemented my respect for that company because this is a gesture rooted in actual passion for gaming. Passion, muses the AAA games industry collectively. What's fruit got to do with anything? Oh hang on, passion, I remember that. That's that thing I pretend to have during E3 and while I'm inside my wife's dry joyless cunt. Anyway, after playing it, I felt the need to play all of Quake 1 again, perhaps in the aftermath of Doom relighting the spark that two decades of console shooters has done its best to smother with its big fat chest eye wall cuddling ass. In truth, I'd never liked Quake as much as other retro shooters because if you want to find the evolutionary ancestor of brown and miserable modern shooters, then Quake makes for a pretty good starting point, since it lacks all the joy and humour of its stablemates Doom and Duke Nukem 3D and is persistently the colour of a wet weekend at the Siberian logging camp. But for all that, it is still a retro shooter of its time, high octane shooting where you move faster than a hairless Filipino boy through a crowded bathhouse, and the story never gets in the way of the action. About the only story you'll get is a paragraph at the end of each episode that reads like John Romero is reciting it at you from across his Dungeons and Dragons table. Quake was the last collaboration between id Software's two Johns, Ramiro and Carmack, before Ramiro went off to make Daikatana out of mousetraps and semen, and Carmack proceeded to craft Quake 2 out of stale Weetabix and paste. Quake 1 finds the happy medium and illustrates why they kinda needed each other. That lightning gun that murders you if you use it in water definitely smells of Ramiro, but at least there's some imagination on display. The colour scheme and repetitive levels were probably scraped up from the Carmack tarmac, but the gameplay is characteristically solid. I like that every monster is clearly distinct, from each other I mean, if not from the background since everything looks like it just dropped out of a sewage worker's nose, and all have a different role in life. The knight harasses you in tight spaces and the fiend harasses you in the open. There's the floating scrag, whose job is to molest you in those troublesome hard to reach places, and then there's the ogre, whose job is to GET FUCKED! You think you're so great sitting up there spamming grenades with impossible to predict bounce trajectories, let's see who has the last laugh after I've quick saved another seven or eight hundred times. And that blob monster in the last episode can get double fucked on a bed of crispy lettuce, the way it hops about like a marble on a honeymoon mattress and hitting it is like trying to swat a fly with your jizz. The weapons are also distinct and functional for the most part, I'm not entirely clear on why we needed a nail gun and a super nail gun. What's the standard nail gun for once you have one that fires the exact same nails but slightly harder, serving drinks and mixed finger food? And the other glaring issue with Quake is the usual one that happened with shareware games. If you don't remember shareware because you're an overstimulated millennial, blinking stupidly at this video as you attempt to pass my words through a haze of ADHD medication and energy drinks, it was kind of like a demo but freely distributed and anything up to an entire third of the finished game, to coax a payment for the rest of it. But the usual strategy was to load 
loads it up with all the game's good ideas. The first episode of Quake is the only one with a boss fight, and even that is mostly spent running around someone's pool house flicking light switches like a fussy dad with an increased electricity bill. The other episodes just kind of meekly stop the instant they run out of brown castles. Hope you like brown castles, because Quake has every imaginable iteration of such. It's got brown castles, it's got ochre fortresses, it's got sepia strongholds, the works. It's like a school field trip to continental Europe during a major cholera outbreak. But you know what, there's still quite a strong atmosphere to it. The actual plot of Quake, reading between the posterior paragraphs of purple prose, is that you are man with gun, Esquire, travelling to evil otherworld to defeat the resident demonic forces. We hasten to add that it's not hell, oh dear me no. Wouldn't want anyone to think we hadn't moved on from doom. It's some other evil netherworld with hostile demons, who put a load of pentagrams and satanic imagery all over the place, not because they're actually in hell, you understand, they're just really big fans. It's more Lovecraftian in theme, really, in that Shub Niggurath shows up at the end, the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, here reimagined as a sort of upside down bar stool, experiencing a very heavy menstrual cycle. But as repetitive as Quake can get with its umber palaces and chocolate chateaus, the world still feels a hell of a lot, sorry, hostile extra dimensional territory mildly reminiscent of hell of a lot better realised than the world of Quake 2, which actually did have cinematics and story objectives, but was, in practical terms, a string of identical grey brown military bases full of hybrid human and forklift monsters. Maybe it's just the fantasy setting that gives Quake 1 the edge, as it adds the intimidating sense that our big chinned hero is somewhere he doesn't belong. Or maybe it's the rather lovely sound design that heaps on the bleak otherworldly atmosphere and gives each monster a unique identifiable voice, although one does wonder why all the knights make noises like an ageing Marlon Brando having an orgasm. As one of the first fully 3D FPSs, it's fun to look at Quake as part of gaming's collective learning process. Mouse look? Why on earth would you want that on all the time? How often will people want to look away from the horizon, I mean honestly. But Quake 1 was a pioneer in more than just the technical field, it's probably one of the first retro shooters to be entirely consistent in tone. A slightly laughable tone, I mean this is a game that gives all its levels names like The Tower of Despair, and the map list reads like the first album from a high school goth metal band, but compare that to Duke Nukem 3D, where pop culture references and monsters going to the toilet are right alongside the captured violated women begging for death, Quake represents PC games maturing out of the in-jokey fucking about and into awkward angsty pubescence for better or worse. Later it would go off to college in Half-Life, join the military for Call of Duty, and get all its arms and legs blown off in time for Gears of War. Games with a theoretically infinite amount of content are all very well, but I don't think the developers ever consider what the fuck we're supposed to do with it all. I mean my kitchen sink can produce a theoretically infinite amount of water, but once I've stopped being thirsty and I'm as clean as I'm ever going to get, and cooked all my spaghetti and filled all the condoms I intend to throw at the bailiffs, then what am I supposed to do with the rest of the stuff? A question worth considering as we take a look at No Man's Sky, a game about exploring a theoretically infinite universe of possibility. Which is a shame because Elite Dangerous is also about exploring a theoretically infinite universe of possibility, and I don't really have room for two theoretically infinite universes in my house. I already sold most of the furniture to make room for all the cooked spaghetti. The setup is, you wake up on a mysterious planet next to a crashed spaceship and after repairing it with raw materials gathered from the surrounding wilderness, you can begin an epic journey to nowhere in particular for no given reason. You gather the fuel to hyperdrive to star system after star system, following a line that eventually leads to some kind of geometric ancient space wonder someone nicked out of a bungee game that gives you a prize bag and another line to follow. The main question for me was what the hell I was supposed to be progressing towards. The ancient space wonders were all shrugging their monolithic shoulders at me. Maybe I'm supposed to be gradually crafting and upgrading my way to the best possible ship and equipment I could have. But the problem with that is there doesn't seem to be any use for your ship and equipment except to find stuff to upgrade your ship and equipment with. Besides that, there's also a laundry list of developmental milestones to reach, most of which are breathtakingly inane, and I could really do without the fucking awards ceremony every single time you get one. Congratulations, you have scratched your ass 20,000 times. Here's a prolonged jingle while this text selfishly hogs the interface for 30 seconds so you can't interact with anything. Congratulations, you have contracted radiation poisoning from a planet's toxic atmosphere. Here's another j- Congratulations, you have died a total of 100 times from radiation poisoning while inches from safety because you can't get inside your ship while I'm telling you about all the milestones you've achieved. What are you, yeah? It's an emotionless Scotch egg powered robot that shuts down when it hasn't had instructions on punch card pushed up its ass that morning. It's not about winning or reaching the end, it's about the exploration and appreciating the unique sights of the cosmos, man. The thing about exploration, my little pubic louse, is that the appeal lies in the finding. You can explore a sheaf of blank printer paper for an afternoon, but it wouldn't exactly stimulate. There's nothing to find in No Man's Sky, you can't find in about 500 million other places. If I ever find myself badly in need of a futuristic shed containing a bench with some Christmas lights on the side, then I can land on literally any planet and start walking in any direction. Every planet is unique, strictly speaking, but every human being is unique, and it's still hard to appreciate that when you're queuing up at the post office behind nine old people who all want to pay with luncheon vouchers. Oh look, this planet has a unique species of quadruped with three horns and nine armpits, but all that it's actually going to do is either wander aimlessly about or run up and nibble your bum. And the crafting system says it all. You kill this one-of-a-kind creature with its unique evolutionary history and are rewarded with some carbon, which you stack on top of the identical carbon you got from the unique and complex creature you murdered in the star system next door. The crafting's not exactly intuitive either. In Minecraft, you put a long stone shape on the end of a bit of wood and one spool of implied duct tape
escape later, you have a sword. With the slightest rearrangement, it can also be a pick or a shovel or a rather uncomfortable rectangular sex toy. Meanwhile, in No Man's Sky, you take your hard-earned carbon and turn it into a green thing that has no use, except it can be turned into a purple thing that also has no use, except that it can be turned into warp fuel. Why not just have us bung a load of carbon in the gas tank and bang our kneecaps with a crowbar for a few minutes? Run out of takeoff fuel on our planet and you might have a moment's drama from having to scavenge more, but then you find some stuck to your shoe after walking ten feet, and there's no point exploring much further because your inventory space is the size of a Virgin Airways carry-on baggage allotment, and I swear I probably found upgrades to my laser gun more often than I got into actual fucking combat with the thing. Not every planet has animals, not every planet with animals has hostile animals, and even when it does there's usually plenty of desolate wasteland to go round. If you need carbon that badly, just land near some trees and inhale a few times. In brief, I was having trouble finding the gameplay in this game. I understand the principle of making your own entertainment, but this isn't that. Elite Dangerous is that because it's complex enough that you can choose the path of trader, fighter or explorer from one of hundreds of possible routes, and at every junction you're extracting in-between challenges from having to land your ship inside a space station without banging into a control tower and knocking your pint of Guinness out of your cockpit drinks holder. No Man's Sky denies you even that. Press one button to take off or land and the game does it all for you, assuming it doesn't make you clip inside an inexplicably hovering ore deposit that's totally meant to do that and not a bug, no really. When you're in flight the game will even automatically pull up to stop you smashing into the ground no matter how perfectly justified your urge to end your tedious existence. It's baby's first Elite Dangerous is what it is. We're strapped into our fucking ultra safe high chair of a spaceship to stare at the huge friendly typeface of a simplistic GUI that looks like a Windows 10 menu by way of the IKEA catalogue. I feel like you still haven't learned to appreciate the unique beauty of the cosmos yard. Hey, I'd appreciate it a lot more if it wasn't constantly popping in like your least favourite neighbour and making the game as immersive as a gravel pit. When I'm descending through the atmosphere of a planet you could at least put up a view obscuring cloud effect so I don't notice the terrain below me switching blatantly to full 3D rendering from blurry 2D Google Maps vision. No Man's Sky feels like one of those crafting survival games that keep popping up on Steam like boom towns in the California Gold Rush and are just as likely to still be populated a few years down the line, but with a load of added pressure to perform that it can't live up to. Maybe if we'd been able to build things, complete the Minecraft comparison, give us a reason to go back to places rather than stampede through space hoovering up resources and space STDs, not much creative fulfilment to be had in renaming the things we discover. I discovered way too many interchangeable things and ran out of euphemisms for genitalia. Does the name Spore ring a bell? Remember what a big thing that was supposed to be before its big idea for galaxy spanning gameplay turned out to be a bunch of little ideas strung together, none strong enough to sustain interest. You know what they say, he who forgets the past is condemned to reset history A level. Grow up is a phrase I seem to hear an awful lot when talking about my job in mixed company, and it is also the name of a sequel to Grow Home, the Ubisoft physics platformer. I say physics platformer, the game itself would probably say, hey there's platforms and you can physic around them if that's your bag, but if you just want to chill that's cool too. Grow up, I had to put up with enough of this chill out shit from No Man's Sky. Give me a fucking challenge or I'll physics you. Oh fine, find the 150 collectibles. That'll do. I will chill after the game has worked my testicles until they're six foot across and the colour of an angry plum, not before, and even then the chilling shall entail beating them back into shape with two fistfuls of ice chips. The premise of the two grow preposition games is that you play a small robot named Bud that can jump and grab things and whose animation is somewhat procedurally generated by the physics engine, which has the usual result that our little robot friend seems to be suffering from the kind of Parkinson's disease that only affects the bottom half. Bud is supervised by a spaceship computer called Mom, and his objective in both games is to climb back inside Mom's welcoming red orifice by directing one or more swelling organic phalluses towards it. It's actually rather clever what they've done with the titles. Not the grow go pun in grow home, Christ no, that's the play on words equivalent of wearing comic sans on a t-shirt. Grow home was about the childlike desire to return to mother after a long day rolling around in dirt molesting small animals and shelter beneath the warm familiar glow she gets when she's been drinking red wine since noon. Grow up, contrarily, is about having to mature and learn self-reliance when our mother unexpectedly explodes and her pieces are scattered across the backyard. Yeah, I've been there, grow up. That was a weird conversation with the gardeners. Grow home was centred around cultivating a single giant plant to reach the ultimate goal and exploring exciting new terrain and floating rocks as they become accessible. In Grow Up, the growing of the multiple giant plants is more an incidental part of the quest for more jetpack upgrades. Which does mean Grow Home was quite a bit tighter. Phew, it's getting more Freudian by the minute in here, isn't it? Someone start getting the ice chips together. In Grow Home, you can get to the top of your flower tower, look down, and there's everything you need to worry about right there, but Grow Up takes place on a Mario Galaxy-style tiny planet surrounded by more floating stones than the Keith Richards Ketamin Party. Points on for freedom of movement and exploration, and points off for figuring out where the fuck I'm going. I look at nondescript floating rock number 731 Gamma, and after consulting my extensive paperwork realise I haven't looked it over yet, but as I'm heading towards it I get momentarily distracted by a farting wasp and when I look back I've forgotten which of the cluster of 17 identical floating rocks was the one I was heading for. We fall back on using the map and objective markers and that's when we realise what Ubisoft have done. They've turned it into a Ubisoft game. Which is to say a sandbox cluttered with repetitive mini challenges with all the joy of exploration and discovery one gets from spending six hours staring at a plate of overcooked pasta. So all you can do is go back to the map screen every five minutes, stick an objective marker on the icon of a thing you want and make a beeline for the massive glowing indicator like a greyhound focused squarely on the rusty bum 
hole of an artificial rabbit. Well, it's not that bad. You have a jetpack, so it at least kicks shit like The Division into a roadside ditch and bangs its frumpy wife. It's just that the jetpack comes on a bit too strong for my liking. You know how it is. You're out on the town, there's an aging jetpack sitting at the bar wearing too much makeup, saying, Why don't you buy me a drink, sugar? I make climbing completely trivial after only a couple of upgrades. Come on, I'll call my girlfriend's infinite glider an infinite parachute and we can have a great big saucy party. Then it starts trying to put its arm through yours and you have to scrape it off on the side of a moving subway train. The Grow Home jetpack was a coy little thing that could just about simulate a medium to severe bout of vindaloo flatulence and the parachute and glider were both temporary pickups. But even as the retarded shark of modernity bites the last few mouthfuls from my raft, I will still cling stubbornly to my central mass which states that video games have to be some kind of game, as in a challenge, rather than Ubisoft's current idea of a game which is 500 trivial button pushing instruction following exercises scattered randomly across a map like cigarette butts on the pavement outside an appeals court. Grow Home had a nasty habit of gluing half the collectible crystals to the underside of floating continents so you'd have to carefully monkey bar your way to them and the climbing controls apparently recently suffered a death in the family and just can't keep their mind on the job. Is my left hand clinging securely, climbing controls? What? Yeah, whatever, you're fine. Release. Plummet. Oh, you meant clinging to the rock. Sorry, I thought you meant clinging to a sense of purpose in life. But in other words, it was a challenge, and to my mind, struggling against the engine is half the fun of a physics game. The mere act of walking bud across slightly unlevel ground has the inherent skill challenge of trying to get home after a martini tasting. Freely jetpacking and gliding everywhere might make for some lovely screenshots, but when I'm beating every race challenge first try with 30 seconds to spare, then calling them challenges risks action from the Advertising Standards Authority. And incidentally, were race challenges really the only thing you could come up with for side quests? In sandbox design, that's fucking level zero. That's the free ink cartridge that comes with the printer, and holds about as much as your grandma's bladder on a long car journey. I like the balance between Zen Fuckabout's freedom and actual skill progress that is struck by Grow Home, and I'd say the first half of Grow Up. Grow Up gives you the ability to recreate any special plant you find, like the ones that will launch you high into the sky if you can persuade the physics engine to let you sit on it without breakdancing right the fuck off it again. That's for progress. Or you can build a fortress of giant cacti that don't do anything except look vaguely like bell ends. that's the fuckabouts part. But the plants become obsolete once you get up to a certain tech level. Who needs to get jizzed into the air when my jetpack can do the same without needing to be excited to orgasm by my frantic jiggling leg. Perhaps there's a hidden meaning here. In Grow Home, the temporary parachutes and gliders were plants as well, but in Grow Up, they're permanent extensions of your cold, emotionless, robotic frame. Doesn't take Northrop Fry to find the subtext there. Collaboration between technology and nature is an inherently temporary arrangement. Now we know why we're a robot alone on a spaceship. What remains of the human race is probably minced up inside the gas tank. Put your mouth over a jet-powered soft serve dispenser and get ready to cream out of every orifice because there's a new Day at Sex sequel. Or rather a sequel to the prequel to Day at Sex, Day at Sex Human Revolution. Revolution, which I think was about some kind of prostitute uprising. While Day at Sex Mankind Divided is about an agreement being reached and the sex humans going back to spreading themselves for all and sundry. None of that is true. Mankind Divided is, however, the second instalment in the life of one of gaming's newest and hottest personalities, Adam I Never Asked for a Throat Lozenge Jensen, best known for his iconic pointy face and voice like a coffee grinder trying to seduce an asthma inhaler. Fans have learned to love his incredible strength of character that compels him to always do the right thing, or to always do the wrong thing, or to go back and forth between doing the right thing and the wrong thing, depending on his mood, his remaining stun gun ammo, and whether or not there are any vending machines to throw at people. Because this is a Deus Ex game, and you know what that means. Choice and consequences, cautionary cyberpunk near futures infused with relevant societal issues of the day, and a protagonist who'd get cut out of a Matrix sequel for taking themselves way too fucking seriously. In the aftermath of the climax of the previous game, when someone drove all the mechanically augmented humans kill crazy by doing the equivalent of posting an honest review of the new Ghostbusters on the internet, humanity is reeling from the attack and augmented humans are regarded with fear and suspicion, on the off chance that something might flip the crazy murderer switch again at any moment. So welcome to episode two of the clumsiest race analogy in all of speculative fiction. You can't split humanity into augmented and not augmented because having oven hobs instead of nipples is not a trait unique to specific families, unless babies are having their legs snapped off as they emerge from the womb and replaced with shelf brackets. To say nothing of the fact that you can't make the few bad apples argument if literally every augmented person went off their hydraulic cyber trolleys and a certain amount of fear might be justified if no one knows that the insane murderer switch isn't still lying around somewhere for some family dog to accidentally trip while rubbing his ass on the carpet. Hey, remember how in the original Deus Ex augmented humans were a pretty small minority and no one made much of a fuss about them because, hey, turns out a bloke with JCBs lodged in his armpits is a useful thing to have in a peacekeeping force or when some furniture needs assembling, and the most of the conflict in the setting of that game was rooted in the divide between rich and poor and insidious population control orchestrated by corporate interests in the media. Oh no, such themes would be completely irrelevant in the current climate, especially since AAA game publishers haven't finished paying all the instalments on their nuclear-equipped supervillain bunker on the moon. Let's just make it all about the people putting sandwich toasters in their kneecaps. Adam Jensen finds himself stationed in Prague as part of a top-level anti-terror organisation whose higher-ups are quite possibly obvious blatantly definitely being leaned on by the secret world government, which you might recognise as being the starting premise of pretty much every Deus Ex game. Fortunately, they save a bit of time by having Adam already working undercover for the secret pro-freedom resistance, who you can tell are the good guys because they're much more racially and sexually diverse. Things explode, tensions rise, and Adam must choose whether to side with his fellow augmented or the obviously corrupted militant fuckheads who hate him. Maybe it's not as straightforward as that, but even as Mankind Divided makes use of the time-honoured Deus Ex tradition of dropping us in the middle of a nuanced 
nuanced situation with nothing but a fish slice and a couple of pages that fell out of a social studies 101 textbook, there's no obfuscating its way out of blatantly being Deus Ex Another One The Game. It hits all the same beats as reliably as a one-hit wonder playing their annual comeback tour. You're based in a hub city where you rub shoulders with every level of society, there's an inexplicably high-tech laser security system in the sewers, at one point you have a boss fight with a ridiculously huge augmented bloke with a comically overdone accent. They even replay the whole subplot about Adam discovering and getting to grips with all the retro consoles and kitchen appliances that someone sewed into his fat ass without his permission. How, you ask? Well apparently after the end of the last game, and incidentally the game couldn't give two squirts of motor oil infused spunk which button you pressed on the ending Tron 3000, and I suspected it couldn't at the time either, Adam spent some time in a coma clinic and someone implanted a fresh batch of Game & Watch handhelds into his buttocks. Blimey, Adam better hope he never goes to robot prison, there seems to be something about his bum that makes people want to stuff it full of hardware every time he goes to sleep. Mankind Divided is a textbook expansion pack sequel, but the problem with that is that Human Revolution was just okay. And when you do a copy paste of a game that's just okay, then any positive feeling the good bits might have given us falls away as the annoyances repeat themselves. I can't stand the way the game goes to cutscene every time you take out a guard or break a wall or break wind, with a pause, a cinematic fade to black and a musical sting as Adam ceremoniously farts with the tenor saxophone implanted in his rectum. It's about as conducive to the flow of gameplay as a fat bloke jumping on a ski lift. The upgrades are still pretty shoddily designed as well, with a lot of redundancy. Want the ability to mark five targets? Not really, since I can see them all on the radar anyway and marking them requires me to pop up from cover and gormlessly stare at them for a second like they're my high school crush and I'm hiding in their dad's rose bushes. Well then how about the ability to mark 40 targets? There's nowhere in the game where there are that many, but it'll come in handy after you get bored and switch to playing Serious Sam instead. I also resent how it doesn't matter for shit whether you take the lethal or non-lethal approach, because I always take the stealth option on the off chance the game has the balls to have consequences, and the slightest mistake leaves me completely surrounded by all the ungrateful bastards I permitted to live. Half the time it wasn't even my mistake, I'd be trying to stealthily kangaroo my way across the rooftops when Adam would decide that grabbing the next ledge would ruin his manicure and drop into a dumpster full of bells and air horns. What I'm saying is that Human Revolution had more room for improvement than this. Yes, one or two complaints were addressed, lo and behold the boss fight has a stealthy option, sort of, but take careful note of my phrasing there, boss fight, as in singular, as in this game is as insultingly short as a budget gob job. There's only one hub city, and after getting dicked about by the Illuminati for about half the length of an acceptable Deus Ex game, everything abruptly ends, with Adam Jensen vowing to get dicked about a maximum seven or eight more times before totally asking them to pack it in. And that's what kills it more than shoddy gameplay or half-baked premise, which in Deus Ex is almost part of the charm. I mean, come on, augmentation racism, where's the dividing line? All right, Mrs. Stevens, we've successfully fitted your pacemaker, now piss off to the ghetto, you org scum! The relationship between Nintendo and its fanbase is a royally fucked up one, I think it's fair to say, and all that business with broken televisions probably classifies it as abusive, albeit the kind that's gotten so weird that the domestic violence shelter eventually blocked their number. If it were just Nintendo getting drunk and punchy because nobody bought the new Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, then perhaps it could be understood, but there are some bizarre mind games going on here as well. Nintendo fans, don't you see that this isn't healthy? Remember when Nintendo abandoned you on the highway because it thought it had a good thing going with the casual gaming audience and you had to hitch a ride home in the back of a dog catcher's van? No, no, they apologised for that. And it was my fault anyway, I should have liked Wii Music more. Things have reached a new low with Metroid Prime Federation Force, it's not just not catering to the fans anymore, now it's going out of its way to finally break their spirit once and for all. It's like Nintendo promised to buy them a puppy and they came downstairs on Christmas morning to find a load of Korean takeout containers under the tree. If you're unfamiliar with Metroid and think it's the word for a hemorrhoid exclusive to people who ride inner city public transport, Metroid is a classic series of sci-fi exploration games and the protagonist, Samus Aran, is as inseparable from them as a dose of the herbs. A stoic independent space bounty hunter fighting a lone crusade against the evils of the galaxy except in Metroid Other M where she was a squeaking Catholic schoolgirl wearing a collection of plastic mixing bowls. Meanwhile, the Federation are a military force that occasionally show up in Metroid games to get indiscriminately murdered and humiliated by whatever needs to be established as threatening today. Making a game entirely about them is therefore precisely the same logic that brought us Aliens Colonial Marines, another game that was a dripping stalactite of frozen piss above a once respectable dinner party. And what makes it all the mightier a kick in the tits is that there was no need for any of this. Federation Force looks and plays passably like a Metroid Prime game, with the usual 3DS provisos that turning around is as ponderous as a merry-go-round full of elephant seals and playing for too long makes my hands feel like a pair of broken deck chairs frozen to the pier in a Blackpool winter. So why didn't they make another Metroid Prime game, with Samus Aran in atmospheric alien worlds in the free exploration Metroidvania style to which the franchise once lent its name, instead of something very conspicuously un metroid besides the fact it stole Metroid's underpants and wore them on its face. Why must we play as a midget inside a robot suit, and since the missions are spent more or less entirely inside the robot suits, why even establish that we're actually tiny Rice crispy Elves, except to make things all the more humiliating? I can tell you that it's not because they didn't want to include Samus Aran, because she constantly shows up in dialogues and mission briefings. It's like the game's holding her over you, like a cruel dog owner whose closed hand might not even contain a biscuit at all. Samus Aran just showed up and told us about another pirate base, shame that you missed her, she's so cool and stoic with cracking tits. She also brought us some homemade fudge, but we ate it all before you got here. The only justification I can see is that the game goes for four player co-op focus and there's only one Samus around to go around, but if four clones of Luigi can be sucking each other off in Luigi's Mansion 2, then I'm sure Samus could have gotten a sorority sister slumber party going. Besides, who the fuck turns to the 3DS for their online multiplayer focused games? I'd nominate a more suitable platform, but my list basically starts with all of them. Or are Nintendo still trying to normalise the idea that people might show up to a dinner party with their 3DSs as an alternative to postprandial Pictionary without it seeming weird? Perhaps a more realistic scenario 
scenario in a school setting, but it still hinges on not only at least four people buying this game, but on them also not being ashamed to admit that they bought this game. The story is there are three planets, the ice world, the desert world, and the world that also turned up, and the Federation are tasked to go there and murder wildlife until the space pirates appear. Which we know for absolute fact will happen because at the start, the commander type bloke goes, don't worry, there's no way the space pirates will show up, rather than each planet having a big interconnected world to explore like it was some kind of fucking Metroid game. It's entirely mission based and we get dropped into small collections of rooms to complete single objectives. There is a solo play mode, but it is a trap. It'll sucker you in with some easy stuff early on, but eventually we'll bring out the missions that are next to impossible without other players. There'll be 500 of those space pirates that totally weren't going to show up, smashing up the thing you're supposed to defend, and you can have all the missiles in the world, but you can only be in one place at a time, slowly rotating like a microwave dinner. There is also another multiplayer mode, which is Rocket League. That's about all there is to say about it. It's Rocket League, except everyone's shooting at the ball instead of hurling themselves at it, like six excitable dogs with only one biscuit. And I imagine it would have been very thrilling if I could have persuaded the connection to remain intact for the duration of an entire match. You know what? I have formulated a theory. From the things we hear in the mission briefings about how Samus Aran has been running around off screen being the best at everything, Federation Force feels like the Darkness 2 style co op campaign running in parallel to the plot of the main single player campaign that isn't actually there. So maybe there was an actual Metroid Prime 3DS game being developed at some point that had the shitty multiplayer mode that must exist as part of the game industry's pact with Satan, but resources ran thin and something had to be cut out, so they cut the single player campaign because the crazy pill salesman came around that morning giving out free samples. And then someone said, Wait, people will be annoyed about this decision. And their boss popped another crazy pill and said, You're right, we'd better put in a soccer mini game to mollify them. After all, the kind of fanboys who wasted their tender years learning to speedrun Metroid on the slim promise of pixel titty are also notoriously keen on team sports. Metroid Prime was the game that successfully translated the atmosphere and feel of Metroid to a 3D first person format, but Nintendo seems to have treated it like the redheaded stepchild ever since. First, the sequels were kind of shit, then it's officially declared non canon in favour of Other M, which is like taking away your child's Christmas present so that the cat can choke to death on it, and now this. Oh, stop comparing it to the Metroid you wanted it to be, Yahtzee. Can't you just accept that Nintendo wanted a new direction and made something a bit more family friendly? After all, they've only got like 90 billion other franchises that do that. Well, then why did they even call it Metroid Prime? Except to deliberately fuck with Metroid Prime fans. They could easily have chucked Samus around in the airlock and more honestly called it Interstellar Midget Footballers, or Tangential Metroid Universe Thing starring the cast of Willow, or Don't Buy This Game It's Shit. Is it me, or is the big release period starting to pull a reverse Christmas, that is to say, getting later every year? If all you want is ports of stuff we already know is good, then your quid's in right now, Lieutenant Lags Behind. Resident Evil 4, Dead Rising 1 and 2, and the Bioshock collection are all out on Expo and Piss Poor this week. You almost think AAA publishers have become a bit risk averse. Surely not, they've always seemed like such sprightly and adventurous, enormous bloated mounds of fat and bloodstained money. There's that new World of Warcraft expansion that YouTube ads seem to think is terribly important I hear about every hour of the fucking day, but frankly I feel like I could have a more profitable time stacking coins on a railroad track. So as always we turn to Steam, the ever-flowing cornucopia of RPG Maker games and pixel art, and this week we'll be looking at two newborns that have cut their mouths on the jagged edges of the pixel art pacifier, starting with The Curious Expedition, a procedural explorer map developed by two blokes who worked on Spec Ops The Line, which doesn't count for much as a selling point because a fly that buzzed into the office and shat on the gold master technically worked on Spec Ops The Line. It also shouldn't be taken as an indicator of content, because while sharing the loose theme of barging into someone else's country to, in academic terms, shit it the fuck up, there's much less horrifying gazes into the abyss of the human soul and far more gleeful nicking valuables from primitive natives in the jolly spirit of 19th century colonialism. You play one of a selection of real-life Victorian figures, and incidentally I've learned to be slightly wary of any game in which Nikola Tesla is a character, the patron saint of socially awkward tech nerds, as they compete with their peers to map out unexplored lands and loot the place. And I did find it slightly hilarious that one of the playable characters is HP Lovecraft. That dude never left the house, and thought Jews and black people evolved from jumping spiders and dog turds, so casting him as an explorer is like casting 50 Cent as Miss Marple. So what we have is the kind of roguelike that has the feel of a pen and paper role-playing session conducted by a DM with very little imagination. You have found a village of natives, they dress and act identically to the natives you met in your last expedition to an entirely different continent, and seem to be aware of what a bunch of dicks you were to them, but then Darkest Africa gets a surprisingly good Wi-Fi signal. You might find the Curious Expedition a wee bit uninvolving, since most of the action is described with pure text, except for the combat where the characters are on screen, far away in the distance in tiny whiny pixel vision, where every single action from attacking to being attacked to having an earnest conversation about the excesses of European colonialism is conveyed by having the character hop into the air a bit. But isn't that in keeping with the spirit of things? Our sense of distance from proceedings echoing the sense of detachment our adventuring heroes have from their own actions as they steal treasure and corrupt the natives in arbitrary pursuit of personal glory? Probably not, actually. Have you noticed that this game is called The Curious Expedition, rather than The Curious Expeditions? Which might have been more honest since a standard campaign involves locking yourself into six successive adventures, but it turns out the title was accurate all along since this is really six repeats of the same adventure. You land, you collect a few colourful diseases and you find a golden pyramid. It's like reading King Solomon's Mind six times with the pages slightly shuffled around. And while we're on the subject, surely Ryder Haggard would have been a more fitting novelist character than Lovecraft, but then I suppose he wouldn't have gotten the instant nerd cred one gets from mouthing Cthulhu and chummily waggling your eyebrows. There's yet to exist a game with truly infinite replayability except that one game where you fire an electrode into the pleasure centre of your brain until you starve to death, but sadly that hasn't yet been ported from laboratory rats, the lucky bastards. 
In the meantime, the last ability of a procedural game lives or dies on variety, especially if the focus is on story over gameplay challenge, and I just don't think there's enough. You have desecrated my temple, now I shall scourge the land with- oh, floods or volcanoes this time. Your Narama, freshen up your material, Tezcatlipoca, mate. So let's turn our back on going to foreign countries and shitting them the fuck up, and for a nice change of scene, play a game about going to one specific foreign country and shitting it the fuck up, in Mother Russia Bleeds, a new game published by Devolver Digital, which is best summarised by saying it is a Devolver Digital game. It has the quintessence of such in that it's horrifying gore and extremity depicted in brightly coloured pixel art, like getting bloodily raped to death in the prison showers by an enormous skinhead made of Lego. Mother Russia Bleeds is a retro-style arcade beat-em-up in the final Street Fights of Rage mould, where half the challenge is not standing one pixel too far north of your intended target that your frenzied punches upset northward passing moths, and the other half is mashing buttons in the vain superstitious hope that it'll somehow make you stand up faster. You are part of a Roma community in 1980s Russia whose simple carefree life of brutal cage fighting with the homeless is shattered when you're kidnapped and subjected to drug experiments by Russian gangsters, prompting a quest for revenge. Which is a bit of an overreaction, there are westerners who'd pay good money for weekend breaks like that. Eventually you get caught up in revolution against the corrupt government, because that's all that ever happens in Russia, isn't it? Drug crime, government corruption and revolutions. Why don't we ever hear about the positive things, like their lovely beetroot soup? Anyway, in the grand tradition of arcade beat-em-ups you have four characters to choose from, the fast weak one, the slow strong one, the in-betweeny one, and the other one for when your mum says you have to let your little brother join in. Not that it makes much difference, they all have the same moves and dialogue, which feels like a missed opportunity. Maybe I want to know if the dude in workout gear with bandaged fists and starey eyes has a more nuanced attitude to proceedings than the girl in workout gear with bandaged fists and starey eyes, but we're not here for story, which is probably for the best because the dialogue's consistently as stiff and redundant as a beached whale at optimal serving time. As I say, the combat's pretty basic and I did get rather over-reliant on the sliding tackle, spending more time on my back than a nymphomaniac skirting board inspector, but the challenge is meaty enough and it's certainly cathartic. Blows land with the satisfying crunch of a big-bottomed lady sitting down on a taco platter and with roughly the same effect upon the face of the target, and enough broken teeth litter the ground that the council won't need to grit the pavement next time there's icy weather. I appreciate the subversive joke inherent in depicting such unflinching grittiness as something as comparatively wholesome as an 80s arcade brawler. It's like the Saturday morning cartoon version of Hobo with a Shotgun, and it's the extremes it goes to that make it fun. If we're gonna smash the few remaining teeth out of a drug-addicted whore, might as well do it with a severed cock sticking out of an overdue library book. Well this is a bit of suspicious serendipity on Microsoft's part. Out we staggered from Metroid Prime Federation Forces Bring Your Own Self-Flagellation Device Barbecue, when Microsoft sidled up and whispered, hey, you like Metroid Prime? And after we'd all finished weeping and rending our garments, it continued, well we've got a game that takes influence from Metroid Prime and was directed by the same bloke who directed Metroid Prime. Ooh. And he also worked on PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Ooh. And it's only available on Xbox One. What did you say, Microsoft? I said it's only available for Windows 10. That's what I thought you said. So what do you call this game? Recore. Recall? No, Recore. As in, take the core out of something, then put it back in. So it's a game about apples, is it? Look, forget the title, just play the fucking thing. So I did. And no, it's not a game about apples. It's a game about some lady hanging out on an inhospitable desert planet who presumably subsists on handfuls of sand and whatever condensation she can lick from the underside of her suspension every morning. What with North America having recently come down with a nasty case of me, I had to offload most of my gaming shit for the move and I'm presently working off a single Windows 10 laptop, but Recore seemed happy to run on it once I'd reduced the resolution down to the equivalent size of a widescreen post-it note and chucked out graphical features like an angry Midwestern dad searching his teenage son's bedroom after he carelessly expresses an enthusiasm for Bob Marley records. It did, however, initially refuse to start until I closed down Steam. Oh, Microsoft, there's no need to be petty. Don't be so insecure. I'm sure there are plenty of features the Microsoft Store offers that Steam doesn't, and I'm sure I could even think of one given a team of researchers and a month. Anyway, as we've established, ReCore is set on a desert world in the process of being terraformed for the human race to populate and spread the incurable disease that is their existence. Our heroine is an engineer tasked with maintaining the robots and equipment that are doing the terraforming, and her name is Jewel, because the writers thought calling her Rosie McLikes electronic shit will be just a hair too subtle. Jewel combines the technical skills, daddy issues, robot dog and vague but undeniably progressive mixed race genetics of Alex Vance with the technical skills, daddy issues and abandoned on a desert planet nurse of that lady from the new Star Wars. Which probably means they sell the likes of her off the peg at the strong female protagonist shop, but perhaps the closer comparison would be Jade, the strong female protagonist with technical skills from Beyond Good and Evil, since both protagonists have to run around one of those Zelda-like open worlds that aren't quite the same thing as a sandbox and get their hands around a load of big shiny balls. Also Jade ran an orphanage and Jewel has to play mother figure to a planet's worth of feisty robots that have been given personalities for some no doubt enormously obvious reason that presently escapes me, taking in the friendly ones and dishing out the spankings to the ones that went astray. For in a plot development about as surprising as your previously not hungry girlfriend suddenly wanting to pinch all your fries, the robots on the planet with completely necessary personalities have declared war on humanity. Humanity's presence on the planet consists at that point of three or four tech nerds, but then I suppose it's good to keep your goals manageable. So what we have here is a game with much of the PS2 era about it, that is to say you jump a lot and collect glowing geometric shapes that are floating a foot off the ground for no adequately explored reason. 
Explode. Speaking of Explode, it has a bunch of token open world side challenges to be attempted alongside the main dungeons, of which there are a grand total of about three, so perhaps main was the wrong word. The dungeons that also happen to be there? And this gets us to one of the major gripes about Recorked, its relationship with the concept of structure is a nodding acquaintancy at best. Once it runs out of dungeons you go to the final confrontation at Fort Climax, fight a final boss and then a fucking stop sign pops up and smashes you in the face like a comedy rake. Find twenty of the magic testicles to proceed! So I tuck my Climax blue balls back inside my trousers and go back to the overworld to meet my quota, come back, get to do another load of climactic challenges before the stop sign pops up again, piss off and dig up another five easter eggs to continue. Fucking hell, whatever exciting Climax is waiting at the top of this tower I hope it's got a fucking book to read. You're just trying to draw your playtime out aren't you Recore? No. I'm not. I might appreciate it in another game, taking the reins off to let us explore the open world, but the problem is the open world is a desert planet, which is one of the definitive boring settings, alongside Antarctic research stations and any living room in which a slide projector has been set up. On top of that, it feels like they built exactly as much world as they needed to contain all the gameplay and then clicked on the little bounding box and expanded it till it was about three times bigger, so you have to trudge through blinding white sand for ages to get anywhere. And since you can double jump and jetpack boost right from the start, it doesn't open up in a gradual, organic manner, there's just a couple of highly contextual environmental barriers you need specific robot side kicks to get past. And that gets me to the next armed grenade hidden in the exploration porridge. Jewel only has room in her strong female protagonist underpants for two robot sidekicks at a time, so if you didn't call the psychic hotline that morning so you brought the smashy robot and the tentacle robot without realising you'd stumble upon something that needs the hovery robot, you get to trudge all the way back to the fast travel point to swap them out. It's like being a server in a restaurant full of Alzheimer's patients. Well I've still got one last bit of bile left and I already read the election news this morning so I might as well vomit it all over the combat which is about as fun as nailing dogs to a wall. The colour coding system is intuitive enough, you have the red red gun, the blue gun and the yellow gun and they do the most damage to enemies the same colour, the excitement of frenzied death battle combined with the wholesome educational value of preschool colouring in lessons, but your capabilities are limited to attacking one single enemy at once when they're always in groups, so you're constantly getting blindsided by enemies whose attacks couldn't give two straining constipated plops whether you think you press the dodge button in time or not. Plus they've all got health bars longer than the amount of time it takes to clean out the bathtub at Brian Blessed's house, and of course the enemies respawn every time you re-enter an area, so I was soon greeting every combat encounter with a weary sigh and a hanging of the shoulders like a water slide attendant watching a massively obese family of four ascend the stairs. On the whole, Recore is very flawed. Better than Federation Force, but then so is getting your nadgers pinned to the ground by a filing cabinet full of unflattering school reports. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. Yeah, you didn't think you'd hear that again, did you? Capcom, far from being a website for people with an interest in cloth headwear, is a global game developer and publisher and massive, massive slut. If Capcom ever promises your console an exclusive game, make sure to hose down the marital bed with a delousing agent because it'll be out with sailor boys every night catching a fresh dose of blistering barnacles. Just recently, two of its hottest properties, Resident Evil 4 and Dead Rising, spread their already barely acquainted legs a little further apart to accommodate a few more console ports, and both of them were at one point pledged as exclusive titles, hilariously enough. But how did Capcom first follow the philosophy of philandering fair-weather friendship? Today, the Zero Punctuation Occasional Guide to Differently Able Moments in Gaming History examines the curious case of the Capcom 5. Not quite as many as the Magnificent 7, but remade about as much. <laughs> The year was the delightfully palindromic 2002, and in the days before Nintendo heard the siren call of motion controls and started naming their consoles after things little piggies have been known to do all the way home, their GameCube was struggling to find a decent market share. Nintendo's days of being king shit of all the lands of gaming had made them complacent and caused them to pick up a few bad habits, one of which had apparently been a tendency to use bathroom disinfectant as a drinks mixer. That being the only explanation I can think of for why the Nintendo 64 was a cartridge console when disc-based media was available. Developing for cartridge at that time was like an animation studio having to paint each frame onto the side of a frightened and Piglet, so third-party developers buggered off in droves to the eager arms of the PlayStation. That particular wake-up call led meanderingly to the GameCube, which had more powerful hardware than its competitors, the PS2 and Xbox, as well as a disc drive, although I guess there was still some of that bathroom disinfectant left over, because it only ran novelty tiny baby discs whose main benefit that I could see was that you could use them to convince someone that their hands had mysteriously doubled in size. As such, the GameCube was failing to lure developers back, and so Nintendo turned to its old comrade, Capcom, whose Mega Man games had made for such a profitable partnership before 256 Colours ruined everything. The relationship was already troubled since Capcom had jumped ship with everyone else to make Resident Evil for the PlayStation, but all seemed forgiven as Capcom announced in late 2002 five new titles to revitalise the GameCube. PNO3, Dead Phoenix, Beautiful Joe, Killer7 and most notably the aforementioned Resident Evil 4, all to be overseen by proven director Shinji Mikami. Things were looking immediately rosier for Nintendo as a representative of Capcom USA claimed that these would all be exclusive to GameCube as he adjusted his Stetson and fired his revolvers into the air, but then the fiasco began as there were a few moments of angry muttering behind the curtains and Capcom USA came back out 
out to say there'd been a communication cock-up and only Resident Evil 4 was confirmed to be exclusive at that time. Now, us mighty spacemen of the future year 2016 can look back on that with a knowing smile because at time of writing Resident Evil 4 has been ported to 11 different gaming platforms and at least one kitchen appliance. Because it is, in academic terms, fucking sweet. I won't say Resident Evil 4 breathed new life into its franchise because to even associate it with the other Resident Evils is like adding David Bowie to the lineup of S Club 7. The writing was as atrocious as ever, but with a self-aware B-movie edge that made all the difference, the completely retooled gameplay was a major influence on third-person shooters still to this day, and the graphics tech was practically next-gen, that is to say, mostly brown. It wasn't so much Resident Evil getting back on its feet as a landmark title in the entire history of the medium, which I do not say lightly, because I just ate an entire fruitcake. But the point is that it alone may well have saved the GameCube, if it had been an exclusive. But as we all know, that turned into a pretty big if. So here's a smaller if. Maybe everything would have still been lovely for Nintendo if Capcom had kept their mouths shut and hadn't announced the PS2 port two months before the GameCube release. Consequently, Resident Evil 4 sold 1.6 million on the GameCube and 2 million on the PS2. What should have been the laying down of a winning hand became the laying of a cruel fist upon the ghoulies. As for the rest of the Capcom 5, the funny thing was that it had no middle ground. They were all either great or great balls of shite. Beautiful Joe was a smart and sexy side-on cartoon brawler that reviewed well and sold perfectly satisfactorily, but Capcom did a PS2 port anyway, as far as I can tell just to rub Nintendo's nose in it. Killer 7 was the game that put legendary auteur Suda 5-1 on the map, but to call it slightly unconventional would be like calling a swift knee in the bollocks a slightly inappropriate response to a question at a presidential debate, and it was destined for cult stardom only, which is a nice way of saying reviewed well, sold like shit. And then you have the other side of the coin. One of the five was never even released. Dead Phoenix was supposed to be some Panzer Dragoon affair, but was cancelled in August 2003, which must have been an easy time to be a video game website headline writer. Dead Phoenix is dead. Bam, that deserves an early lunch. The final game was PNO3, a third-person shooter about a lady who dressed like a MacBook trying to disguise itself as a kitchen appliance, and constantly moved like she was busting for a piss. Critics and audiences panned it alike, and so naturally it was the only one of the five to remain a GameCube exclusive. Here's your consolation prize, Nintendo. It's a bag of lawn clippings and dead wasps. The end result of the Capcom 5 was that what should have been a boost for the GameCube turned into one broadcast after another that Capcom had zero faith in the console, and Nintendo wouldn't forget. In fact, rumour has it that the whole debacle is why there weren't any Capcom characters in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and if it's true, then that's the most pathetic attempt at revenge I've ever heard of. It's like telling the bloke who murdered your family and stole all your money that you've expelled him from your best friend's treehouse club. I think it's pretty clear that Nintendo remains steadfast in their blindness to the lessons of history by even after all these years having no idea what they're doing when it comes to third party development. After all, they released Metroid Prime Federation Force instead of selling the entire stock to hot air balloon pilots for use as inexpensive ballast. Still, they remain the kings of awkward hardware and ruthless exclusivity, despite exclusivity being an utterly anti consumer practice that a sensible games industry would have thrown out with the fucking oscilloscopes. I'm glad that Capcom maintained the policy of keeping their options and their legs open. So when I call them a great big whore, I want to make it clear that it's not meant as a criticism. Quite the opposite. Some of my best friends are whores, as long as I keep up the payments. As many of you know, I like it a bit hard. This is something also well known to my escort service and my accountant, but I particularly like my games a bit hard. I put it down to my school days and having to navigate the shower room after games, running the gauntlet of kicks to the bollocks and nervous experimental jets of spunk. But there are a couple of different ways hardness can manifest in the trousers of a video game. The Dark Souls method, as is well documented, is to blast you in the face with a rake that takes off all your health the instant you arrive, in order to organically train you to nimbly dodge the rake so that it can gently brush part of your foot on the backswing and take off all your health regardless. And then there's the kind of difficulty that sneaks up on you like the proverbial frog in the slowly heating boiler that considerable experimentation has proved doesn't actually work, which can be a much more insidious form of difficulty because it lets you in the door with a condescending smile and waits until you've gotten comfortable with a plate of digestive biscuits before it quietly locks the soundproof doors and produces what looks like a tool used in vehicle maintenance. And this week I played two Steam games that subscribe to this philosophy of difficulty, starting with Cluster Truck, which is one of those kinds of games at the Porus Dervat school where 90% of the design document was just the words a license a physics engine in very big letters. It's a first person game where you are a dude or a dudette or a walrus or whatever you'd care to imagine, with the ability to accelerate to a speed somewhere in the region of the clappers, and your job is to get to the exit of each level without touching the ground, as the only things you're allowed to touch are a large number of trucks moving vaguely in the direction you're heading. There's not much in the way of story to give that context, but it reminds me of a game I used to play when I was a kid, and bear with me because I know this sounds pretty crazy, when I'd pretend that the floor, right, was made out of lava, of all things, and would kill me if I stepped on it. I know, I was such a kooky random little bastard back in the day. I'm surprised my parents didn't lock me in a straitjacket and have me sectioned a lot earlier than they actually did. Anyway, the standard response to the summary of Cluster Truck is, is that it? And frankly, yes. There's an emphasis on speed and competing with the times of other players, but the top ten on the scoreboard are all inevitably 0.1 of a second. And you know what, guys? If you're gonna hack the board, at least come up with something believable. You're like the guy who turned up to the dick measuring contest with a Cumberland sausage ineptly stapled to his foreskin. The developers valiantly attempt to expand gameplay with a series of unlockable gadgets and abilities, none of which are of much use compared to the jetpack and the slow motion, which are among the first ones you can get. But fair's fair, the 80-odd levels of the game ring about as much potential as there is out of the concept of jumping all over a 
a convoy of trucks as they navigate a Mario 64 level, we start out on straightforward country roads and by the end are hopping across trucks on a giant rotating cylinder in an abysmal hellscape. And while as the levels get harder the chaotic nature of all the moving parts means that you're relying on a lucky quirk of the physics more than acquired skill, failures barely have time to register as you restart the level with a single click of the mouse, or a violent and bloodstained third of the mouse after frustration builds up, but try not to lose composure, that's how you get sectioned. As for if I'd recommend the game, I dunno, I certainly got absorbed in the way one does during hate sex. On harder levels the frustration grows as you restart again and again until everything becomes an annoyance, the trucks, the levels, the room around you, your redheaded stepchildren. When I started writing this review I was genuinely going to go off on one about how you die if you touch ceilings and walls as well as the floor. What, have we got truck exempt brittle bone disease? You don't lose the floor is lava just because you knocked over the standing lamp, at least not till your dad gets home. But I had a nice cleansing poo and calmed down. Cluster truck's so basic that recommending it feels like recommending the sensation of immersing your hands in a bag of dry rice. There, I hope that informs your purchase decision. Let's move on to our second game, Lichtspear, which is not as one might reasonably expect, a game about violating the personal space of Albert Speer, architect of the Nazi regime. Although you might be vaguely in the right ballpark because it is a game based loosely around Germanic mythology, by which I mean there are a lot of characters with beards and someone used find and replace to switch all uses of the word the to the word das, and I think Strudel gets mentioned at one point. You are the chosen warrior of a huge bearded god of war who has grown bored, possibly because they're looking for decent indie games to play on Steam in late September. You are granted a magical pink spear to thrust deep into the flesh of hundreds of burly enemies for his divine amusement in a way that has not at all become ever so slightly a suspect now that I'm coming to write it down. It's a 2D game with a somewhat arcadey feel where your character nails his feet to the floor and must repel oncoming hordes of monsters by chucking spears, adjusting the angle and power of each throw as necessary. So sort of like tower defence meets worms except the tower is you and the only worms will be the ones feasting on the blanket of corpses you leave in your wake. Just like Cluster Truck, Lick Spear gets as much mileage as it can out of a simple core concept. Some enemies are slow, some are fast, some are high up, some have specific weak spots, and some of them are walruses. And on that note, if your dad used to dress up as a walrus and beat you with a fish while playing I am the walrus so that you get conditioned to react with fear and disgust every time you hear that song, it still wouldn't make you as poorly disposed to walruses as this fucking game will. I was having fun at first, nice simple core gameplay and the sight of your spear gracefully arcing across the room into a cabal's eye socket couldn't have given me more satisfaction if it had been my own thrusting pink phallus going on a brain matter safari, but then the insidious difficulty creep began and I started to find some of the design questionable. I don't like how you can't use your special powers during boss fights because boss fights are supposed to be tests of all the skills we've learned, so changing the rules for them is like basing the final grade on the student's penmanship and how they look in a swimsuit. Also, if you miss a spear three times in a row, your patron deity gets cross and you're stunned for a moment, and that's not going to help a struggling player bounce back, is it? It's like the moment of invincibility after you get hit in Sonic the Hedgehog, except instead of invincibility it decks you in the face and forces you to apologise to all the nice monsters for wasting their time. I almost felt like the game resented me for playing it. I get that, Lick Spear. I feel the same way sometimes about people I invite over, when they stay past my bedtime and scoff all the biscuits and still refuse to sit under the pendulum. I find myself wondering if Paper Mario Sticker Star did alright. Not by my standards, and I know I sometimes give this impression that a game would have to escape from cold dits and fall to its knees at my door to commence a blowjob marathon that makes my feet recede into my legs to impress me, but Sticker Star was a particular thorn in my suppository because the older Paper Mario games had humour and life and creativity, whereas Sticker Star has… well, it has stick Stickers. Nope, there it is on Wikipedia. Sticker star, mixed reviews and the lowest scores of any Paper Mario game. Well, that clears it up. Now I understand perfectly why Nintendo thought, yes, this is the one we need to bring to Wii U. This is exactly what our ailing brand needs, a good hard shot of mediocrity that will pull our bootstraps about halfway up before getting bored and wandering off. You know, I seem to remember being a bit down on Super Paper Mario when it first came out on the Wii. Now I'm counting the days till the NX comes out and Nintendo does the usual thing where they stop supporting the previous console but one and thinking of all the things I should have said to Super Paper Mario before I pressed down on the pillow. Paper Mario Color Splash opens with Mario and the Princess arriving at a mysterious port town to find answers to a mystery, which made a single cobweb fall off my long dormant stiffy, because that's how Thousand Year Door started, but nope, it's just the usual thing, monsters have stolen the local six or seven important and inevitably star-shaped artefacts of power, and the person behind it all begins with B and rhymes with something Inspector Gadget used to say a lot. And after restoring the first of the inevitable star-shaped things, it's parked its pointy bum down for less than a second before Princess Peach gets kidnapped, which I wouldn't have minded, but then a nearby toad comments, oh no, Bowser kidnapped Princess Peach! What a totally unexpected happenstance. And you know what? Fuck you, Paper Mario Color Splash. There is a difference between clever subversive self-parody and just doing the same thing you always do but sarcastically rolling your eyes at it. Don't kick me in the bollocks and say, gosh, wouldn't it be funny if I were really kicking you in the bollocks? What bothers me the most about these last two Paper Marios is that there's such a brazen lack of effort on display. And this isn't fucking Wii Fit Trainer's quest for the perfect bleached asshole, this is Mario, Nintendo's fucking A-grade intellectual property. Yeah, Pokemon might be the money maker now, but Mario's the pimp daddy, it has to pay at the end of the night. If they were going to crowbar the wallet open to create new content for any game, you'd think it'd be for Mario, but nope, still using the same flea-bitten paper cutout sprites Paper Mario's been using for over a decade, and I assume some have gotten more flea-bitten than others over the years because every non-hostile NPC in this game is a generic Toadstool man, every single one. Some palette swapped, and they all have the same role in life, throwing out glib sarcastic remarks on the utterly pedestrian things
things that surround them in half-assed acknowledgement of the obligation for funny dialogue. This might sound like an odd thing to harp on, but what the fuck happened to Toadsworth? You know, the scholarly advisor toadstool man with the stash who used to hang around Princess Peach like he was trying to wipe his ass on the toilet paper stuck to her shoe. I ask because there's a character filling that role, but you guessed it, it's a generic indistinct toadstool man. And Toadsworth's been in previous Paper Mario games, what happened Nintendo? Did the dog knock over the bin with all your old sprites in it? By now I'm sure the Nintendo fans are nervously chewing on their Triforce-shaped asthma inhalers trying to get a word in edgeways. Oh Yahtzee, stop giving us the same old shit about Nintendo not giving us the same old shit. So it isn't like the Paper Marios you used to like, so what? It's Nintendo's property and they can do what they like with it. Alright, granted, I might point out they keep slapping the Paper Mario name on it, but then this is the eternal paradox of Nintendo, isn't it? Exclusively makes games catered to the nostalgia crowd and yet goes out of their way to annoy them at the same time. But play it your way, I shall now stick this red hot wire coat hanger down my ear until I've forgotten about the good Paper Marios. <laughs> there we go, now, flurble blurble recidivist Mario cunt. The gameplay of Colour Splash revolves around paint. You're questing for the six magic paint stars and have the ability to smash paint onto white things with your hammer to restore them. I think I understand the wheeze now, Nintendo are going through every substance and object one could possibly associate with paper crafting. Last time it was adhesive, now it's paint, next time we'll probably be rescuing the six magic sheets of blank printer paper from the clutches of King Hole Punch. The plot establishes that the villains are draining paint from characters to make them lifeless, which creates a paint as blood metaphor that gets more fucked up the more you think about it, as Mario gaily romps through the world pouring blood on things, as well as smashing objects with a hammer to recover blood from them, and using blood to infuse his combat cards with power like a deranged satanic ritualist playing Yu-Gi-Oh. On that note, the combat system is not dissimilar to Sticker Stars, as you explore you constantly pick up cards representing single forms of attack, and in each round of combat you choose what cards to inflict upon the enemy. I find this combat style to be the proverbial styrofoam packing material in the Noki, and now I shall explain why. In a normal RPG, annoying as it is when the game stops you every ten steps to blow the random encounter trumpet, we take the consolation that every fight gives us a little experience and makes us a little bit stronger. In the colour splash and sticker star system, however, getting caught by a random battle is totally disadvantageous. Cards are single use, so you might have to waste a four crikey death spooge on two one-legged special needs goombas and a soggy biscuit. The only benefit you can get is money and expanded blood capacity, but virtually everything in the environment disgorges money and blood like a pole dancer with the Ebola virus. If Nintendo were hoping to move Sticker Star to a non-handheld console, then the joke's on them because I ended up playing in controller-only mode just so I wouldn't have to be constantly looking up and down like I was lying on my side at a tennis match. Even then the basic combat was arduous. How many button presses does it take to jump on a Goomba in Super Mario Brothers? One if it's already moving towards you. Meanwhile, in Colour Splash, first you've got to drag the shoe icon into the card slot, then fill it with paint by awkwardly fingering it, like you're navigating thick pubes and aren't sure if you found the clitoris or a forgotten sultana, then confirm your selection, and then they make you flick it off the touchscreen for no particular reason, unless Nintendo thinks there's mileage in a bogey disposal simulator. See, now that we've established that fun and original storytelling isn't part of Paper Mario's appeal, splurgle splurgle fuck mother hairy pipes, then fun gameplay is the only thing left it could possibly stand up on, but the combat is both disadvantageous to get into and not fun. Which is not my idea of core gameplay, except in the sense of core, this gameplay's shite. Holy lemon scented twat wipes, let joy be unconfined, let every child in the land gorge themselves on crisps beneath the swaying boughs of a shady tree, let every teenager's bedroom emit a sound not unlike that of hundreds of ham sandwiches being rapidly and rhythmically dissembled. For the AAA drought season has finally come to an end, no longer must we stew in the swirling piss ponds of the indie market to brave the knobbly pixel art todgers as they bloodily trundle in and out of our nether holes like indecisive pine cones. No longer must we be victimised by comedy walruses, the sun has risen on a new dawn. So what's for breakfast, AAA games industry? Well, we thought we'd start you off with a crime sandbox in which you systematically liberate a load of districts with repetitive stealth and cover-based shooting missions. Oh bollocks, I forgive you, Comedy Walrus, all aboard my nether holes. Yes, if Mafia 3's intention was to very firmly put on its most generic underpants to start the AAA season as it means to go on, then it did an excellent job of that at least. Hope you want a little backwards B branded onto your thumb from pressing the contextual stealth kill button 500 billion times. Mafia 3 takes the series' particular brand of GTA knockoff to the deep south in the era of the civil rights movement, where we play a young black Crim named Lincoln Clay. Oh for fuck's sake. Lincoln from Abraham Lincoln who freed the slaves, Clay from Cassius Clay, also known as Muhammad Ali. Nice. I know the race issue was going to be unavoidable in this plot, but you might as well have called him Jerome K. Black person. 2K certainly felt it was unavoidable because the game opens with a very Assassin's Creed-esque disclaimer to the effect of a lot of people are going to be saying very horrible racist things in this game, but please understand we had to put all that in to accurately bring the era to life, and when you think about it, not putting it in would have been even more racist. Right, now that we've gotten that out of the way, nigger 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 coon coon spick. I get that the 60s deep South literally was more cartoonishly bigoted than a 2016 presidential candidate, but having granted themselves the all clear to say the N word, I suspect that the writers started slightly getting off on doing so. I'm not one to judge, I'm going to say the word retard right now for literally no reason, but don't get all hand wringingly sanctimonious about it when your game also contains Italian gangsters with Tommy guns who talk like they're never more than three wisecracks away from bursting into a song from Bugsy Malone. Any sandbox game that tries to have a serious message about societal ills and the corrupting nature of violence is going to be an inevitable tonal disaster area when two seconds later you can slow motion ramp over a creek 
Lincoln smash into a gangster so hard that a neatly bound wad of bills flies out of his nose. But anyway, Lincoln is a member of a black gang in service to the Italian mob when his people get betrayed and he gets left for dead in the classic revenge narrative opening act that I think most screenwriting software will automatically fill in for you these days. So off on the revenge rampage we go. The Assassin's Creed comparison continues, because do you remember how in Assassin's Creed 1, before the series became good for approximately one and a half games, there was a shopping list of assassination targets that represented story missions, but before you could do any of them you had to do a minimum of repetitive side missions and it was like watching a TV show with 500 ad breaks? That's Mafia 3's problem. Mafia 2's problem was not having enough side stuff and being too linear, so at least they're trying, but they're overcompensating with the steering and skidded right off the road and down the side of Mount Boring. It's like all the game's missions were loaded into a blunderbuss and indiscriminately fired at the map. The notion that the player should have the freedom to choose what order they do things in has the usual result that we have a to-do list instead of a difficulty curve. Freedom's overrated, guys. Yeah, Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison, but I can guarantee that he never banged his shins on any coffee tables while he was in there. About the only time the game got hard was after it bugged out in a way that made mission indicators inexplicably disappear, which happened more than once. So I just have to drive around looking for large concentrations of enemy dots on the minimap and hope it's not just the ice cream shop giving out free samples to bastards. But Lincoln can't manage the day-to-day -day running of his conquered territories when he's got a busy schedule of hiding in bushes waiting to stab people, so the unique selling point of the game is that after taking over a district we must make the difficult decision of which of our three underbosses to leave in charge of it. Except it's not a difficult decision in the slightest. There's nine districts, three each. Bam. None of the underbosses run the rackets any better or worse than the others, so divvy them up evenly and everything's chocolate tulips. This is the illusion of management gameplay where none truly exists. You don't get to micromanage how much laundry detergent the cocaine gets cut with, or how many strokes is too many for a five dollar hand job. What happens is that the underbosses give you better and better upgrades and benefits for the day-to-day -day gameplay and you can favour a boss to get their benefits quicker. But none of them are worth alienating the others for. The Irish mob guy, for example, who is drunk and fighty and associated with the colour green, because that's how committed we are to making a serious point about racism, will teach you how to steal cars without being noticed if you please him enough. But the very first base level benefit he gives you is the ability to have someone bring you a car at any time for free, so what's the bloody point? The others give you stuff like more ammo capacity and NPC hit squads, but the game gives you see enemy through walls o vision and a distraction ability by default, so I could have gotten through the whole game just as easily with one of the starting guns and a staple remover. You don't exactly have to claw for every possible advantage when you're up against enemies that will keep coming over to check the mysterious whistling doorway with seven or eight dead henchmen scattered around it. By the end of the game I was struggling to remember why we were supposed to hate the main bad guy. He killed about 0.01% of the people we've killed and had been running a bunch of naughty crime rackets which we proceeded to take over and not change in any way, but he also had an overarching sinister diabolical scheme to set up a legitimate business, leave the criminal life behind and create a future for his children. Oh hang on, he does say nigger once or twice. Well okay then, say no more. Let's drive his harmless old ass to suicide to show how much more enlightened we are these days. This may be intentional, the story acknowledges Lincoln's hypocrisy at times, but the problem is I don't think Lincoln ever is a relatable underdog. He's left for dead and vows to bring down the mob with nothing to his name but his two fists, his street smarts and the backing of a rogue CIA operative with access to all the resources of the United States government. Wait, what was that last one? It's made out like Lincoln is the criminal mastermind but every single thing he does is planned and supplied by the CIA dude, who now that I think about it shows up in the plot with no introduction and never interacts with anyone else. What, is he Lincoln's fairy godmother? You know what's funny? Sticking fish fingers up your nose and blowing raspberries to the Captain Pugwash theme tune. But you know what's funny about Gears of War? It's a series with a fairly respectable heritage about it, an early Xbox 360 game attached to the venerable Cliff Blazinski, with focus on a grand architectural aesthetic and a solid core gameplay style that has had a lasting influence on shooter design to this day, and yet when you actually sit down and play one of them you swiftly remember, oh that's right, these games are for absolute cretins. Every aspect of a Gears of War game, from the way characters waddle about the battlefield making it sound like they're carrying rucksacks full of saucepans, to the incessant asinine dialogue, to the fact that you could cut two minutes out of literally any Gears of War game and I doubt I could tell for the life of me which of the four it came from, although I bet confidently on those two minutes consisting of hanging around a bunch of chest high walls shooting at dudes that look like the Sugar Puffs monster, make playing a Gears of War game feel like trying to explain something to an incredibly slow-witted man who will get angry and sit on your head every time you say a word he doesn't understand. Gears of War 4 continues the story of a brave group of plot writers as they struggle to continue a plot that was supposed to have been decisively tied up at the end of Gears of War 3. The Locust have been gone for about 30 years and the human race have had time to get into some nice traditional internal squabbles between those who want to live in walled cities where robots cater to their every whim, and those ostensibly much smarter and more relatable people who want to live in wooden huts and shit in the woods. Although in fairness, the only city we get to see inside of seemed to be entirely deserted except for robots and Sarah Palin. Shortly, this uneasy peace is shattered when a new threat arises, and by new threat I mean precisely the same threat as always. The locusts come back. That's about all the explanation we get. The locusts can just all come back to life, apparently, if they detect perfect environmental conditions for sequel. This established, one wonders why the characters are even bothering to fight them. The enemy's immortal, guys. I think this planet is officially a lost cause. Maybe we could find another 
one that doesn't have city destroying superstorms every half hour. Speaking of, if these storms are a regular thing, then why does one completely destroy Marcus Phoenix's house the moment we show up? Surely it would have had to have weathered at least a few of those before we arrived. Oh, whoops, that was a bit of a spoiler, wasn't it? Because when the game starts, we're playing as an all new, fresh faced Scooby gang of infuriating youngsters whose quips make me want to grind a broken highball glass in their eye. So we might take from this that the series is at least trying to make a fresh start, even if the combat's the same and every character still looks like they're wearing a neck brace under their flesh. But then, two chapters in, Marcus Phoenix shows up and the plot proceeds to revolve around him for the remainder of the runtime. Maybe a Gears of War sequel being a sequel to Gears of War isn't exactly an automatic strike against, but even in his prime, Marcus Phoenix was a boring, grunty misery guts with one end broken off his emotional spectrum, so God knows why you'd think he'd liven up the new cast now that he's undergone no development except he's rocking a grey beard and a catheter bag. Then, towards the end, all the other old characters show up to save the day as well, because fuck it, let's turn this into a later next generation Star Trek film where the entire cast obviously have their girdles laced up so tight they're going cross-eyed. Pandering is a good word. So stuck up its own ass, it's wearing its own large intestine like a wizard hat is a good several words. There's even a scene where the characters put on classic armour from the old games in a room like a fucking Apple store as the music swells and it's like the scene where Batman puts his stockings on at the start of the third act and I had a little laugh because there was one piece of women's armour for the token lady in the party and it was about one tenth of the size of the men's chest plate. It was like a meerkat infiltrated a gorilla sanctuary. So all in all, Gears of War 4 feels largely unchanged from the established formula and the series remains about as resistant to evolution as a school board in the deep south, although they do mix up the gameplay a grand total of about three times in the course of the campaign to play a bit of tower defence. You have to protect a central area from three waves of baddies and you're given a little spending money to place turrets and such like. Unfortunately, in single player at least, the game gives you barely enough each round to buy one turret and maybe a Twix on the way home, and the turrets are made from oily rags and rye vita so these sections very swiftly turn into yet another identical bloody shootout. I mentioned asinine dialogue up there, and you know what? I get the feeling Gears of War 4 was a gig that the voice actors either absolutely loved or utterly dreaded, because on the one hand all they had to do was show up at the studio and say the following three lines, that's the last of them, let's keep moving, and ooh this isn't good, and bingo that was 90% of the story dialogue done. Then it was just mid-combat one-liners to worry about and all they had to do for that was candidly record the voice actors squeezing their pimples, got one, scratch one grub, etc. But on the other hand, it's gotta be a chore for any serious actor to try to inject life and personality where none exists. I think I see why they gradually brought all the old characters back and turned it into Aliens vs Last of the Summer Wine, because after two chapters of just the new kids on the block it was painfully clear that things weren't working out, with our hero generic white dude with unflappable hairdo and chin like a fucking Transformers lunchbox, his black best friend and token lady to rest his mouth on when they're done dribbling banalities at each other. One of them is the smart technical one, one of them is the ditzy one, and one of them is the one taking things seriously. Unfortunately, I guess there was a bit of a falling out in the writer's room and they couldn't agree on which was which, so as a compromise the game spins a fucking wheel at the start of every dialogue and randomly reassigns the roles. So once again I reached the end of a Gears of War game and find myself hard pressed to recount any highlights because I spent most of it lulled into a trance. I know there was a bit in an industrial area and a bit in some caves and a bit in a town with once proud architecture now besmirched by the unfeeling hand of conflicts, but that could be any Gears of War game, or indeed most games. You know, I pause for a moment in any given shootout and I look at the sheer detail in the surrounding environment right down to the cobblestones in the floor and I have to wonder, how does the artist who painted that cobblestone feel about all their hard work being part of something that passes through the mind so utterly inconsequentially? As the target audience trudges on to find another thing to shoot, ignoring a brief character moment to shove another handful of cheesy snacks down their orange stained windpipes, I wonder if they ever dream of doing more artistic fulfilling work, like directing facial cum shots. So it's officially shoot to season 2016, the wonderful time of year when the spectre of consequence-free violence stalks the land, draining the nation's supply of ADHD medication. I've got the usual variety twin pack of Battlefield and Call of Duty on the list, but after Gears of War 4 I didn't want to be that guy who played too many shooters in a row, and then drank a shooter while watching Shooter the 2007 Mark Wahlberg vehicle, and then became cursed every full moon to transform into the chairman of the National Rifle Association. So instead I thought I'd have a go on PlayStation VR. It would have been remiss of me not to, since I've been talking VR up for years. It's a genuine advance in immersive gaming, how can it not be? No matter where you look, you cannot be anything but in the game because you nailed two TVs to your fucking face. Admittedly, VR is still struggling through two major teething troubles, firstly ensuring that the player doesn't look like a massive knob end to passers-by, aka the Google Glasses conundrum, and secondly, that it makes most people want to puke until their sex organs are dangling from their nostrils like Christmas mistletoe. But hey, Disneyland broke down on the first day too, and VR wasn't started by a closet Nazi. The other thing that makes VR interesting is that it's one of the few areas of gaming that's still evolving and exploring possibilities. Standard gaming tech has basically been perfected for years, but the hardware lads still try to convince us we're missing out if we're not playing Halo in 10,000p, counting every piece of gravel in Master Chief's driveway. Resolution in VR, meanwhile, is still crap. It's like sticking your heads in a bucket of Lego, and improving that would actually mean something. Let me reiterate now that motion controls continue to be a used teabag full of hot sewing needles, and it upsets me that publishers keep trying to pair VR with it, in the same way one pairs a punch bowl with a stream of piss. It makes no sense to me because it's combining a more immersive gameplay style with a less immersive one, effectively cancelling them both out so you end up with nothing but incessant calibration tests and a living room full of trailing wires. Thankfully most PSVR games let you use a standard controller, but motion controls were always part of the broader initiative to market video games as a party starter. That wholesome box
blocks of living room fun, around which inoffensively attractive 18 to 35s gather in pastel shirts to have quality time. And I get the sense that PlayStation is having trouble relinquishing that mindset. Push your VR-based local multiplayer party games all you want, there's no denying that VR is inherently a single-player innovation. It's a device for lonesome spots to find more lasting escape from a cruel reality. Which is great, because it means those spots aren't shooting up movie theatres, or hovering around an office Christmas party making suggestive remarks about volivants in a disastrous attempt to flirt. Speaking for the spots, then, the PlayStation VR helmet is comfortable enough to wear, with enough adjustability that I can find the sweet spot where my vision isn't blurred and the bridge of my nose doesn't hurt after a bare 30 to 40 minutes of fiddling, which puts it above average for commercial VR headsets, and then there I was inside the virtual world with a heavy thing hanging off my face like a tortoise was trying to mate with my cycling helmet, which doesn't help with the queasiness, but a big part of that is game design, and developers are continually finding new ways to mitigate the issue. Batman Arkham VR, for example, hits upon the clever notion of being such incredible garbage that you close the game in disgust before you have a chance to feel ill. Thirty fucking bucks I paid for a half-hour CD-ROM virtual tour from the mid to late 90s, I'd have expected more if I found it on the cover of a fucking magazine. Now I know why I couldn't find a free demo of it, the demo would probably have been two nanoseconds of Batman looking sad. Here They Lie was better, a rather absorbing horror game about exploring a dilapidated and increasingly fucked up city that'll probably turn out to be hell or limbo, because that's usually the case in games like this and, well, limbo. It is a linear walking simulator and there's not a whole lot of gameplay, barring a few rather anticlimactic monster hiding moments that felt more like a simulation of trying to walk home from work without having to pass by groups of scary looking teenagers, but I enjoyed it nonetheless, which may prove my point about VR as it was absorbing enough for me just taking in the sights, standing on the edge of bridges, leaning over and looking down to see if I could spot places the developers forgot to texture. I was, however, a little bit confused by the turning controls. Every time you nudge the right analogue stick, the game pulls a black bag over your head, rotates you precisely 45 degrees and pulls it off again. I assumed it was another puke preventative, but I wouldn't have thought merely turning around would have caused a stress mess until I played Windlands, which is a game that lets you turn off the black bag approach, and turning felt like my brain was attached to my eyeballs with partially melted slinkies. Windlands is a rather basic platformer with an air of my first Unity project, but if you're looking for an encyclopedia of nausea prevention aids, then look no further than its options menu. You want black bag turning? You want to disable strafing? You want to stick your head in a great big hamster ball? Come on, there's got to be at least one combination of these that will keep your lunch down while you enjoy the very expensive tech investment you've got strapped to your bonds. About that hamster ball thing, there's the option to put a cage around your head, partly because one must occasionally take a risk trying to stay ahead of fashion trends, but partly because having something stationary around you helps with the nausea. Hey, I thought we were sitting immobile on a couch, says Mr. Body as we play VR. What's all this jumping around and exploring dilapidated cities business Mr. Eyes is going on about? I'm confused, so I'm going to have a big sulk and send all this food back up to Mr. Mouth in protest. No, wait, says Mr. Eyes. Look, there's a stationary cage around us. We are sitting immobile after all. Hmm, story checks out, says Mr. Body. My apologies, back to normal business. Let's eat something bad for us and have a quick wank. That's the theory, anyway, and perhaps it's the reason why VR comes into its own with games where you're piloting a vehicle. It would be a shame if VR ends up only really working with certain very specific kinds of games, like the thing the Wiimote had with rail shooters and bugger all else, but doing only one thing can go a long way if you do it well enough, and anyway, vehicle-based gaming covers a large variety of experiences, from Forklift Simulator 2016 to giant mech combat in orbit around the planet of tits. The game that finally gave me the VR experience I wanted was Eve Valkyrie, a space shooter. That was where it all came together, the yawning majesty of the infinite but an inch of plexiglass away, interludes of intense three-dimensional combat, looking down and seeing the body of someone attractive and physically fit. Of course, the only version of the game available cost me $90 and only had three story missions, which is taking a not insignificant amount of piss, but you know what, there's no need to rip the toilet seat out just because there's a bit of piss on it. That's what your sleeve is for! Regular viewers will know that I have a bit of a wasp in my urethra about illogical sequel numbering. Mainly I worry that after the apocalyptic global conflict that will accompany the new American presidency, the future scholars of gaming will be terribly confused. We found Battlefield 1, 2, 3, 4 and 1942, so by my count we're missing 1938 episodes. But there is a slim justification for the titling of Battlefield 1. Firstly, it's sort of a play on words. Battlefield 1, you see. Congratulations, you have won a battlefield. Hope you like shell casings and entrails. And of course, it's a clever reference to the game being set in World War 1, which in the run-up to release, many pundits and players rightly thought could be just the kind of of fresh thinking that would breathe new life into the genre. For one thing, it'll mean that battles will be taking place in literal fields, and the whole affair won't be infused by an inescapable air of dishonesty. And without the benefits of modern weaponry, the gameplay would call for a wholly different, more thoughtful approach to- What was that? cries Battlefield 1. Sorry, we were busy giving automatic machine guns to every motherfucker on the planet. Oh. Well, World War I was a conflict without clear heroes or villains, just millions upon millions of young men being sent to tragic, pointless deaths in the name of nothing but an international game of political bum-bouncing, so there'll need to be a thoughtful, more morally complex approach to the storytelling. What was that? cries Battlefield 1 again. Sorry, we were busy making a story campaign about rugged, English-speaking fancy boys squinting heroically into the middle distance as they mow down dastardly jabbering krauts by the hundreds. I wouldn't harp, but there's this whole bit in the introduction where an American and a German soldier lock gaze over a field strewn with bodies and both lower their weapons in recognition of their inner humanity that can never be erased by a system that's 
sees them as naught but expendable cogs. And then five minutes later, it's back to four. Massacring expendable cogs sure is fun, eh, lads? Even if you're playing as the German side in the multiplayer, the bloke on the briefing menu talks with that first. Mark and evil German fairs, fearful punish these stupid American cowboys for the glory of the Kaiser. Mm. Battlefield 1, what on earth was the bloody point in the setting change if you're just going to treat World War 1 like it's World War 2 but with slightly sillier hats? Anyway, the campaign is split into a number of short war stories, some very short indeed, so while we can enjoy a variety of highlights from multiple theatres of conflict, we've also got about 11 seconds to get attached enough to our temporary protagonists to give a shit. The first one is about a British tank crew consisting of the traditional joke scenario of an Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman, and begins a running theme in the war stories in that all of them could have been renamed What the Fuck Happened to the Backup. We start off joining a big push against German forces alongside a load of other tanks and infantry, and then one seamless transition later, our tanks trundling through a haunted forest by itself. Sarge, we did tell someone we were going this way, didn't we? And we didn't get the directions wrong, and the rest of the British army aren't having a picnic in the Hundred Acre Wood next door. While I appreciate the overall intention to focus on the personal struggles of the people caught up in the war, the arcs here are even more predictable than they are on the Champs-Élysées. The rookie protagonist has to take charge, the commander gets wounded and sacrifices himself to destroy Germans who have taken to crawling over the tank like Geiger's aliens, the asshole guy deserts but comes back to save the day and get redeemed, conveniently right after I finish doing all the important murdering, so that episode defies expectations like a bowl of porridge. Next, we play a cocky American pilot and aching great Ponce who steals a plane but redeems himself the usual way, i.e. murders a whole bunch of Prussians. And this is the chapter where the dime store novel heroics are at their most at odds with the overall tone of the Enterprise, but it's alright because at the end the protagonist goes, psych, unreliable narrator, bitch, which is one step up from it was all a dream for creating a sense of, hey viewer, we just wasted your fucking time. Not that there aren't good, unreliable narrator stories, but Battlefield 1 is no one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and I suspect use the device less out of high literary ambitions and more out of really liking consequence-free violence. The third story is about Italian war heroes, and as one might reasonably expect is the shortest of the campaigns, ah ha 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 ha. Then there's one about Gallipoli, where an Australian war hero goes from treating his green young sidekick with naked hostility to surrogate father figure over the course of a sparrow fart. And finally the action moves to the Middle East, where Lawrence of Arabia and the Bedouin nomads are recast as Robin Hood and his merry men, complete with cartoonishly villainous Sheriff of Nottingham. So overall, the whole campaign has a tone wavering madly between World at War documentary and Christmas Panto. Look, I'm not expecting a war game to have me sit in a wet hole getting trench foot for eight hours while composing sad poetry about man's inhumanity to man. Emphasis is on game after all. But don't pretend like you're giving us a serious history lesson in between the cathartic video game fun. It's like you threw a gin-soaked raunchy Christmas party in the Playboy Mansion and then sat in the middle of it getting chin-strokey maudlin about the true message of Jesus Christ. But the campaign intends to serve a purpose besides engaging storytelling, which is probably for the best. It is of course preparation for the multiplayer. We've done the standard shoot a bit, some guerrilla warfare and some tank and plane piloting, and we've had to deal with blimps and an armoured train, all of which come up again in multiplayer, although sadly there's no rideable Lawrence of Arabia. Now, I really am a lot less down on multiplayer than I used to be. I know it serves a purpose, it's important we know who's the best at this sort of thing in case the army invents an assault rifle shaped like an Xbox controller, but I still just can't fathom the appeal of Battlefield multiplayer, because I don't want to spend one third of my time getting shot at by people I can't see, and the other two thirds with my face in the dirt, hoping to be noticed by the medic standing two feet away working his underpants out of his bum crack, and then after a while my team either wins or loses, which was nothing to do with my or any individual soldier's efforts and therefore as significant as the football results from the International Space Station. And then everyone goes, ooh, GG, look at how close the scores were. The scores were close because we've been smashing random particles together for 40 fucking minutes. Of course they're going to average out with a sample that size. Still, the multiplayer is where Battlefield 1 finally captures the true spirit of the First World War. Just imagine that every soldier whose life you briefly control and just as quickly squander had six months of training, a home to which they will never return, grieving parents and perhaps a puppy sitting pining on the doormat making noises like this. <laughs> you bastards! I know that historically it's Queen Battlefield and King Call of Duty that share the dogshit crown as they drift through the skies of the annual shooter season like two greasy zeppelins made of rancid luncheon meat, but this year those two have undergone trial separation. All the signs were there, the way they'd both surreptitiously roll their eyes as they air-kissed for the photographers, the occasional half-hearted stabbing. They've had to face the fact that the mutual love of realistic violence fueled by politics on a level appreciable by frustrated chest-thumping cockslops just isn't enough anymore, because Battlefield got back into historical war reenactment and Call of Duty got back into sticking rabbit turds up its nose. Happily, a much starker parallel exists in this year's shooter season between Call of Duty Infinite Warfare and Titanfall 2, so I'm going to do them together, because I'm trying to keep on top of the year's releases and I want to get the shooters out of the way so I can stop reflexively reaching for the iron sights button every time I aim my piss stream at a toilet bowl. Titanfall 2 is, spoiler warning, the sequel to Titanfall 1. Basically the same, but with a single player campaign now. But I hope it doesn't expect to score any points for that, because selling Titanfall 1 at full price without single player was like forgetting to inflate the bouncy castle and resulted in about as much head trauma for me. Call of Duty, meanwhile, decided to start doing games about modern warfare a while back, but now the series is like the brooms from the Sorcerer's 
Apprentice. They've kept doing that because no one told them to stop, and things have reached the inevitable conclusion with Call of Duty Infinitum Warfare suddenly being in space, like it's a fucking Saturday morning cartoon adaptation. But the question you have to ask with sci-fi is if the story actually needs to be sci-fi and couldn't work perfectly well set in, just to pick an example completely out of the air, the First World War. Tittyfall does, because both the plot and the gameplay centre around giant robots and jetpacks and there weren't too many reports of giant robots in the Somme. Maybe they were all being very quiet, we'll never know. The main purpose of the sci-fi setting in informal warfare, meanwhile, seems to be for the sake of showing us people we have been clumsily assured are bad, getting their shit ruined in more and more spectacular set pieces. And the actual plot could be transplanted into literally any preceding Call of Duty game because it's the same cast as always. Bunch of shouty, interchangeable lads, all with the single defining personality trait of being very dutiful, like they're answering a call of some description. And in the final act, they all start getting picked off with the laughable regularity of a game of this little piggy. Both Titty Flaps 2 and Infantile Warfare open with a narrated plot recap for a plot that hasn't actually started yet, unless you count that fucking elevator music of a story Titanfall 1 claimed to have, I suppose, with a clear intention to establish the bad guys as bad. Titty Flaps gives us the IMC, evil corporation oppressing independent planets for their precious resources, fairly cut and dry stuff, whereas Call of Duty Infy Winfy gives us the SDF, Mars-based military nation that despises the people of Earth because question mark. Their leader is played by Kit Harrington, and after carefully analysing his performance in this game to ascertain his character's motivations, the only conclusion I had reached was that Kit Harrington could be outacted by a dying blobfish in a Kit Harrington mask. Like a teacher's pet with an exhibitionist fetish, telling is never quite as satisfying as showing. Tittyfuck 2 swiftly backs up the opening plot dump by having the main character, who had one of those generic everyman names that I can't remember, so let's just call him Brian Twatchops, join a big assault against the IMC that promptly goes about as well as a charity barbecue at the home for very large, very poorly trained dogs, leaving Brian alone and scared behind enemy lines with a face full of dirt and someone's shoe up his bum. Great! Threat established, protagonist sympathetic. Nice work. Meanwhile, the first we see of the very threatening SDF in Call of Duty improvised wanking is when we ambush and kill a bunch, break into their house, kill about 50 more of them and smash some of their stuff before getting killed ourselves by Kit Harrington, which is as humiliating as getting licked to death by a mule. We then cut to our real protagonist, let's call him Barry Pisscup, going on about how the SDF must be taken to task for defending themselves against the previous protagonist and ruining his attempt to break his massacre record. Compared to interminable whining, Titwank 2 is the better experience, but then so is licking a used scouring pad. So let me clarify that even in a vacuum, like say the vacuum of space, Titwank 2 single player is pretty alright as campaigns go. Brian Twatchops teams up with a pilotless mech to form a vaudeville comedy act, based around pulling the I am oblivious to your human sarcasm gag about seven million times, but the AI comes to respect Brian's skills and their relationship actually means something by the end. Meanwhile, Impertinent Waffling also has an AI character, who is exactly the same as everyone else except he's got a traffic light for a head, and another character is really awkwardly and inexplicably racist at him for no better reason than so he can equally inexplicably stop being racist two missions later, which made me go, uh oh, I smell hastily resolved character arc, wouldn't start reading any long books, Mr. X racist mate. Not that the plot points in Breast Descent 2 are any less predictable, but at least there's a sense of growth and development to get us invested in characters. The problem with Call of Duty plots is that every character starts out as an off the shelf, fully developed soldier type with super skills and various hitherto unmentioned super weapons ready to be pulled from their arse, and the plot is just about giving them an excuse to use it all on something that will bleed or catch fire amusingly. Brian Twatchops isn't even a mech pilot when he starts piloting a mech and has no super weapons up his arse, save a military issue breakfast burrito. The curious parallels between the two games continue in that both feature wall running and double jumping, but Booby Tits 2 bases the levels around it with wide open spaces, jumping challenges, and hard to reach secrets, whereas Indecent Wobbling takes place in the usual claustrophobic ruined cities and military bases, and I think you're only obliged to wall run maybe twice in the whole campaign, making the wall running just another toy for a spoiled child, another lovingly crafted wedding cake to mash up and add to the trough. Breast Melons 2 has its issues, of course. In fact, the biggest annoyance for me in the giant robot piloting game was having to pilot a giant robot, which I know is like saying that I'd love sucking my fat grandma's asshole if it didn't taste so horrible, but switching between the runny jumpy on foot controls to thundering about like your fat grandma's clinging to your legs makes for a jarring contrast. And since you only get into your mech to fight other mechs, you don't even feel more powerful. Your health bar is still disappearing like chocolate biscuits around your fat grandma. But what's Ignible Weatherman got to compete with it? The token flying vehicle that controls like a magic carpet? The whole game's already far beyond fat grandma, not unlike the Atkins diet. So what happened to all that speckled guff about female characters in gaming? Seems like it wasn't that long ago that people kept going, more female protagonists! Female gamers need characters they can identify with and look up to, because it's not like themes of adversity and the human condition are fairly universal. No, I can only possibly relate to a character with whom I share some circumstantial physical characteristics, because I'm fucking psychotic. And then the developers said, well okay then, and we better dress them up in outfits that show off those circumstantial physical characteristics as much as possible, since they're apparently so important. And that, if anything, made things worse, but you know, I totally agree with this sentiment. After all, I have to have a whiteboard marker on hand when I play Tomb Raider so that I can draw a little moustache and beard on Lara Croft and start giving a shit about her problems. But unless you let the player pick their gender, then you're going to have to alienate someone. We should thank Dishonored 2 then for doing just that and postponing the inevitable apocalyptic gender war for another week. In Dishonored 2, you can choose the protagonist closest to yourself and avoid being alienated by the thought of having to lug a pair of unwanted ovaries stroke gormless gonads around. You can be Empress Emily Caldwin if you're a girl murderer, or you can be
can be previous Dishonored protagonist Corvo Atano if you're a boy murderer with absolutely zero sense of narrative structure. For you see, I went with Emily despite my personal tits deficiency because that was the better story. After having been a child and amazing human MacGuffin in the first game who Corvo had to save and resave over and over again like an expensive cheese that never gets fully eaten no matter how often we bring it out for guests, Emily is now Empress of Dunwall and ruling it about as well as could be expected from someone who was raised by an authority in throat stabbing and little else. That is to say, she's fully bent over shitting things right up the flagpole, so to speak. She's promptly overthrown in a coop orchestrated by a pair of Disney villains and must prove she has the will to fight for what was originally handed to her on a silver platter and rescue the man who once rescued her. Classic passing of the torch sort of sequel plot. Meanwhile, players Corvo and you get to go through basically the same motions as last time with a bloke with no need for character growth as long as he remembers which end of a knife goes into what squashy bits so that in the end he can rescue Emily again and resume his position as royal arsewiper general. Still, you might pick him if you want to take a nice hot soapy bath in Stephen Russell's Garrett voice again, which was to my mind a slightly manipulative bit of casting. Aw, oh, did the Thief reboot piss in your eyes, fans of the Thief series, it seems to say. Come over here and let us lick your face clean for a while. Obviously I will, Dishonored too, but what else are you bringing to the table besides face licking and protagonist with optional number of testicles? What do you mean, what else? You need more? Yes, besides the evil rats now having been replaced by evil wasps, and moving from fantasy steampunk London to fantasy steampunk Calais, there's probably a Brexit reference in here somewhere. Dishonored 2 is more of Dishonored 1, albeit a bit shorter and without the third act twist I could have seen coming from the International Space Station. More roof hopping mission based stealth fun and the tone of the ending depends on whether you solve your problems with artful character assassination or the boring old regular kind. Which is not to say there aren't a couple of gimmicks sprinkled hither and thither. In fact I'm a little bit weirded out by the fact that I've played two games in quick succession, this and Titanfall 2, both of which introduce out of nowhere a gadget that lets you switch between two different time periods which you can use for precisely one mission before it disappears down the game's butthole forever. I think you boys had better see me after class, someone has clearly been copying somebody's homework. It's funny how they both do it for only one mission too, normally an innovative mechanic like that would have a game entirely based around it first that earns some critical acclaim, before bigger studios start ripping it off for one mission gimmicks like a huge stupid jock trying to memorise one poem to impress the girl he likes, but we appear to have entirely skipped that step. Nice to see that the march of progress has brought us new horizons in the field of uncreative hackery if nothing else. Otherwise if you played Dishonored 1 you should already know what to expect, stealth gameplay made fairly uniquely efficient by the addition of a short range teleport power that can pull you out of sticky situations, which is only fair because half the time it's the thing that put you in the sticky situation in the first place. I think I must have accidentally condemned the teleport power to 20 years in the Chateau Deef at some point because its revenge was elaborate and well planned. You can trust me, I will totally teleport you safely onto that fifth floor window ledge across the street. Aha! Vengeance is mine! Have fun escaping those 97 police officers with your shin bones sticking out of your armpits, motherfucker. The stealth is rather unforgiving. Get spotted by a police chihuahua and every fucko in a two block radius instantly knows your location and your least favourite place to be stabbed, and getting into combat with any number of fuckos greater than one is like being a hamster trying to navigate its way out of a powered waste disposal unit. So I did the non-lethal playthrough first as Emily for the challenge and ending that actually feels like an ending rather than a finger wagging chastisement to a bad dog who ate all the biscuits, and figured I'd then quickly do a murdery playthrough as Corvo for the fun and to see how things changed. Except two missions into that I stopped because I wasn't having fun and I felt like I already knew what would change, largely bugger all except my NPC friends would say slightly disapproving things with the neutral expression and monotone voice with which they expressed their undying admiration last time around. See, Dishonored 2 doesn't fix the major problem I had with Dishonored 1 which is that the dialogue is about as lively as that of the adults in the Charlie Brown and Snoopy show. The world building's fine, there's lengthy books on every shelf that the writers clearly put a lot of work into, but there's something so lifeless about most of the characters and their line deliveries. It's like the Borg put on a production of Hamlet. When the guards close in for combat, their taunts and threats sound like they're your dentist examining your gum line, and I'm pretty sure every single one of them has the exact same voice. So when you've alerted a bunch and they're all closing in for the kill, you get this very surreal experience where they're all drably taunting over each other. It's like hearing a snatch of the voice actor's internal monologue as someone offers him a second piece of cheesecake. Just kills my whole investment in the plot. You can have all the passably entertaining gameplay in the world, but I find it hard to give a shit when no one around me seems to. Sort of the opposite of the problem I have with public bathrooms. Ubisoft, serious question, are there any actual human beings making your decisions anymore? Your credit sequences are longer than an episode of Inspector Morse, so I know human beings are involved somewhere, in the same way that that cloud of smoke coming out of the concentration camp chimney probably involved human beings at one point, but the moves Ubisoft have been making lately are consistent with an entity that has needed to have the concept of human emotion patiently explained to it. First, people complained about Assassin's Creed Unity not having enough women, so that got fed into the calculating machine and out popped Assassin's Creed Syndicate with optional female protagonist and remarkably gender diverse clockwork orange rape gangs, and now after everyone pointed out that the story of Watch Dogs 1 was a depressing self-pitying grit fest starring the world's least interesting vigilante tramp, the calculating machine has promptly taken the obvious step in the exact opposite direction with Watch Dogs 2, and made it about colourful wisecracking millennials who if left to their own devices would probably devolve until their spoken language consisted entirely of sarcastic memes and snorting noises. Our protagonist is Marcus Holloway, a gifted young hacker who was wrongly sentenced to community service and decided that the most balanced level-headed response would be to start gunning down police officers. To this end he joins an underground hacktivist group consisting of two spectacular superspergs, a fairly indistinct black dude to whom I immediately pointed and yelled that motherfucker's gonna die first, and a girl 
girl with a middlingly brown skin tone, cornrows on one side of her head and a white girl hairdo on the other, who I can only assume was an attempt to fill the entire diversity quota with a single character. All these youngsters talk the way a room full of 30-something writers assume kids talk like these days, but despite being the kind of achingly trendy that starts aging poorly the second after the producer envisions it during a Turkish bath gob job, the story of Watch Dogs 2 is remarkably reminiscent of Hackers, the 1995 movie starring a young Angelina Jolie. With some differences, Marcus doesn't get off with the hot girl hacker at the end, because that would require either character having a granule of passion and genuine human warmth. Also, the tagline of Hackers was their only crime was curiosity, which would require a bit of modification to apply to Watch Dogs 2. Perhaps their only crime was curiosity, trespassing, criminal vandalism, assault, bank fraud, grand theft auto, and one or two good old-fashioned first-degree murders. And that's where the tone problems come in. Because the Streetwise Treehouse Club are already difficult to like when they're sitting in their mum's basement quoting goofy memes at each other, and then they leave the house and commit vigilante murders. It makes them come across like reckless idiots with no grasp of the consequences of their actions. If the game was a more overt spoof, like your Saints Row or your Sunset Overdrive, it might work, but the overall tone is a hair too straight-faced, probably because the points being made about data security, technological integration, and corporate control of the populace are actually very relevant to our present lives, magic wand phones notwithstanding. In which case, you know how you explore those themes? By making the hero a normal fucking dude! Not a grim gravel-voiced Avenger, and certainly not a neon pink rollerblading Scooby gang who all deserve to have their mouths filled in with expanding foam sealant, admittedly while the game does its best to tempt you with a selection of colourful firearms with cute names that are sure to give your victims a chuckle as they struggle to breathe through the blood bubbling up from the ruin that was once their jaw, you can stick to stun guns and wholesome non-lethal traffic pileups, but there's still an air of hypocrisy. Hey, let's hack into my niece's stream and humiliate her live, to show her how bad it would be if some nasty person hacked into her stream and humiliated her live, goes the premise of one side mission. It'd have been nice if the plot had had a self-reflective arc, and so long as I'm fantasising it would also have been nice if there had been a plot at all. I'm going into spoiler town now, because I need to illustrate my point and because I hate you and I'm an antisocial massacre in waiting. Remember that bloke I immediately realised would die first? My obvious correctness need go unstated, but are they killed by the main villains to up the stakes? Or to make the hero start taking things seriously? Are they bollocks? They're killed by a hitherto unmentioned street gang, and avenged five minutes later in a manner reminiscent of the nerd frat house in the college sex comedy, avenging themselves upon the jocks with a strategically placed pig in a cheerleader outfit. On reflection, most of the missions involve targeting or being targeted by a hitherto unmentioned organisation and hacking their headquarters until you can find and publish all the shady stuff we've done. .txt. The only connecting element is the main villain, who materialises every now and again to go, hello everyone, don't forget I'm the mastermind behind all these seemingly and functionally unrelated events, until in the final mission you take him down in a way that I feel like we could have done at any time. So the story aspects are complete wash, frankly. Although not without some highlights, there's one bit where our heroes target a movie studio for misrepresenting hackers in the media, and that made me laugh so hard that my lungs inverted and flopped out of my mouth like a pair of greasy oven mitts. It's a shame because the gameplay is actually a lot more fun than it was last time. The remote control car and drone are good additions to the preparatory, distant approach to problems, although it's a bit weird how guards smash your toys to bits at first sight and start patrolling for intruders without even considering the possibility that it might be bring your incredibly spoiled children to work day. But sitting safely outside in the grass, gaily downloading data while the security guards roam about angrily barking like their owner pretended to throw a ball is quite satisfying and is after all what hacking should be about. Not brightly coloured assault rifles or beaning people with a tennis ball on the end of a string that we nicked from a dog toy shop. Sadly, Ubisoft are all aboard the do it your way bullshit van and don't want to dictate how to play the game like they're some kind of, I don't know, game designers, so every mission is set up to allow pretty much any approach, including crawling through on your belly using only your cheek muscles, and consequently tends to be a tad too easy. Even when you get spotted and have to go in guns blazing, the stun gun is an instant takedown with infinite ammo. And guards forget that you're there if you stand behind a middling width lamppost for 10 seconds, so I can't recommend it if you want a challenge, nor if you want a good story, so what's left? Well as I say, there's some catharsis to be had from the core gameplay, especially if you have frustrations you want to take out on the Bay Area, or rather a miniature effigy of the Bay Area with about 0.0001% of the traffic. Historically, I've approached new Final Fantasy games the way a schoolboy approaches being pushed into the girls' toilets, take enough of a look around to tell your mates about afterwards, and then get the fuck out before I begin to physically transform into a girl, all caring about my appearance and employing the adjective dreamy. But you'll be pleased to hear that I managed to play Final Fantasy XV for quite a bit longer than usual, to just before the estimated onset of my first period. Of course I'm joking around in my usual cheekily abrasive sort of way, saying Final Fantasy is for girls would be a terribly regressive statement, but I can't help noticing that in Final Fantasy XV, our typically androgynously handsome young prince his quest is to marry his sweetie pie in a fairy tale wedding, and in order to do this he must join a boy band and get through several months of cohabitation without sucking a single one of their dicks. A Final Fantasy for fans and first timers boasts a slightly perplexing splash screen every time you turn the game on. I'd thank you to let me be the judge of that, Square Enix. I know publishers like to dictate to game reviewers a lot these days, but this is cutting out one middleman too many for me. It must be said though, anal man to see 15 or older is indeed distinct from its predecessors, in that I mostly understood what the fuck was going on. It's a nice straightforward plot for once, we are Noctis, a prince who wears Wellington 
and boots and took his name from the instructional sign on the front door of the school for the mentally slow. Off to get married to secure peace between kingdoms before a giant fruitcake sized dump is dropped onto events when the Empire invade our homeland. I wonder if these evil, constantly expanding superpower nations have ever considered the PR boost they'd get from not calling themselves the Empire. I mean, the Federation from Star Trek does basically the same thing, but everyone likes them because they're called the Federation and brush their teeth once in a while. Anyway, the Happy Town Snuggle Club invade our homeland and Noctis must journey around the world building his powers until he can take the fight to them. Alongside his three constant companions, Gladiolus, a beefy mullet head who was doing crunches when everyone else was learning how to do up shirt buttons, Ignis, the smart one who looks like Travis Touchdown's more successful cousin who always sarcastically asks him if he's gotten a real job yet at family get-togethers, and Prompto, a 14-year-old girl in a miniskirt who's probably only here because the other three needed something warm to park their todgers in on wintry nights. So as I understand it, the obligation at this point is to decide which of the four absurd hairdos on display we'd like to have brushing along our inner thighs, and take to our bed with some appropriately sized scented candles. But I can't say I can place a favourite because none of them have much depth or clear motivation besides Noctis, and Noctis can eat shit. I can't sympathise with his struggle because he doesn't seem to have one. Everything's handed to him because he's a prince. His magic powers, his super weapons, his fancy car and three paid friends, one to chauffeur, one to tuck him in at night and one to practice kissing on. People literally give him free boats and he's still got the cast iron balls to be generically broody all the time. Even his sexy bride was assigned at birth. Some of us can only get results like that after a long back-breaking evening digging up fresh graves. As is often the case with digi-downloaded AAA games, Final Fantasy XV has strange ideas of what constitutes enough installed to be playable, but at least I had the chance to really drink in the title screen for the several hours necessary for the installation to fully finish, towards the end of which I said aloud, look, we all know you're going to cutscene it up for half an hour before we get going, Final Fantasy. How about you just show me that while we're waiting? But in yet another stark contrast to established Final Fantasy, XV does not pace like an incredibly poorly dressed slug. It's straight on the road to start seeing the world. The open world, that is. Closer to the typically Japanese model of open world games than the Western one, less focus on freedom of movement and more on finding and unlocking the many wonderful flavours of inane busy work. So don't expect to be ramping your car off babies' heads and landing upside down on the distraught mother's picnic sandwich platter. They won't even let you drive in the wrong lane as you make your way through long stretches of very picturesque bugger all. So if you happen to like exploring Northern California in Google Street View, then here's the game for you. I was somewhat reminded of Deadly Premonition of all things, as that too had a lot of driving through mostly empty scenery, a weird fixation on the main character's diet, and rather tedious side quests mainly based around fetching stuff because the only core gameplay mechanic besides driving about is the combat, and the combat, as Wellington once said on the eve of the Battle of Vitoria, is a bit of a pisser. Not that I want to discourage Final Fantasy, for years I've been saying to JRPGs, look, make the combat either turn-based or real-time, every time you go somewhere in between it's like watching the mutant offspring of a clam and a racehorse attempting to drag itself into a furnace to end its misery, and Final Fantasy XV said, fine, it's real-time combat now, kiss my ass," Which is good. And the switching between holding attack to attack and holding dodge to dodge is straightforward enough, but it all hinges on being able to tell which section of the unfolding carnage is actually you, and not, say, a brooding androgynously handsome bramble patch. And having your three helpers around doesn't help the confusion any. Why did we all dress in black today? And couldn't at least one of us have combed their hair with an actual comb and not an electrified sawfish? This is probably why the game gives you the ability to teleport out of the fight and survey the thrashing cloud of limbs and teeth from afar, but I'm confused as to why magic attacks do friendly fire and have a huge blast radius, and consequently why the game suggests I equip my NPC pals with a sub, when it feels safer to entrust my kids to a chainsaw juggler as they picnic in the shade of Godzilla's swaying bollocks. I definitely played 15 for longer than most modern Final Fantasies, but in the end just as decisively drew a line under playing any further because the combat had shifted from fun size annoyance to medium and was showing no sign of reversing that trend, but what really clinched it was a side quest introduced some ways into the game when the girl, who had muscled her way into a vague love interest position with no input or encouragement from me whatsoever, suggested I use a nearby plot to grow carrots. And all at once the spell broke. I realised if the game was throwing inane bullshit like carrot farming at me 20 hours in, then it was probably going to be inane bullshit all the way down. This is of course assuming she was being literal and wasn't making some subtle come on along the lines of plant your big root vegetable all up in my window box. Oh man, this is the end of an era. It's only Half-Life 3 left in the infinitely prolonged sense of vague disappointment bucket, and after that the industry is going to have to mishandle a whole batch of new long-term projects to tease us with, and that's just not going to happen until hype for AAA games becomes worth giving much of a shit about again. The Last Guardian was announced nine tongue spunking years ago. An entire tonsil jizzing generation of consoles has passed between it and its predecessor Shadow of the Colossus, and I'm pleased to report that The Last Guardian is disappointing right out of the gate as it turns out that the title doesn't mean anything. It's a game about two pals and neither of them are the last of anything, or strictly speaking Guardians. The boy isn't a Guardian, although he may need one as he can't seem to get through one minute of his life without braining himself on a bit of old wall, and the monster isn't a Guardian either, it's a sort of puppy kitten baby goat budgerigar thing like a merging together of all your deceased childhood pets, but I suppose Shadow of the Colossus didn't mean anything either. Yeah, the Colossi had shadows, but then so does Peter Weller and it wasn't called Shadow of Robocop. If you're familiar with Fumito Ueda's previous works, Ico and Something of the Colossus, then you should already know what to expect. A young boy getting concussions left and right like a blue bottle trying to navigate a drummer's convention, ancient ruins, lonely atmosphere, a yellowish-green filter on everything, everyone talks of vaguely Japanese 
sounding made up language and the camera refuses to behave itself. Seriously, if Fumuto Ueda made a VR game, then the player's body would spontaneously generate new orifices just to vomit out of. And that isn't helped by the way the slightest touch of the stick makes the main character fucking sprint in the given direction, waving their arms. Although that is admittedly a fairly understandable response to having spent three hours trying to teach a giant muskrat eagle vol thing how to shit on the paper. But we get ahead of ourselves. The setup is, we are a small boy who wakes up in a gigantic ruined castle, covered in strange tattoos and lying next to a colossal hairy monster. Obligatory, yeah I've had mornings like that, joke. Your objective is to escape from the castle while a bunch of resident scary dudes with glowing eyes would rather you didn't. You may have already noticed that this setting and premise is pretty much identical to Ico's, which may explain why this game took so long they were waiting for the last few Ico fans to die of old age. The only difference is that the princess you were rescuing in Ico has been replaced with a giant winged coyote lamb thing. Which might sound like a not insignificant difference, but there's about the same amount of brain power on display. While Yorda was a rather oblivious little moo who seemed like she needed a few good firm slaps before she could register the time of day, you could at least grab her by the hand, pull her over to the ledge and keep rubbing her face across the brickwork until she figured out she was supposed to climb it. Meanwhile, you grab onto Mr. Woofy's back chicken leg and at best you'll get whiplash as he absentmindedly scratches his ear. And the dynamic has changed in that you're sort of the one being escorted this time. You need Captain Whiskers to get you up to high places and to beat up the schoolyard bullies, but it's uphill work when he seems less interested in your goals than he is in finding a nice giant toilet to drink out of. I must say at this point that the developers should be congratulated on what a superb job they did at making the giant sparrow hamster act convincingly like a real animal. It moves exactly like a cat, and it stares blankly at you like a family dog trying to passive-aggressively protest the amount of Christmas dinner going into you and not him. But I'd say the emphasis is on cat, because you have about as much direct control over Fuzzy Chops as you do on a bar of soap in the bath. You start the game with the ability to call him to your location, which is slightly redundant since he usually follows you anyway because he's still mulling over whether to play along or bite your chitlins off. Later on your relationship improves and you can actually start giving him commands, such as jump or go vaguely in that direction, or look around at precisely the moment I attempt to leap off your head onto a ledge. Oh sorry, my mistake, that's not a command, he does that one for free. And jump seems to be quite an interpretive command that can equally mean jump up to the next ledge or jump down the seven or eight ledges I just spent the last half hour trying to get you to climb. So what you're saying is that the gameplay mechanic of directing your huge ferret osprey around is quite challenging, almost like it's some kind of, say, video game. I see your point, Josef Mengele, but a challenge isn't fair if the elements don't act consistently. For example, our furry friend is supposed to catch things that fly towards his mouth, but about half the time the neuron apparently doesn't fire and he just zones out like he's thinking about Jaffa Cakes. This is very hilarious when you're trying to chuck him a treat and it bounces off his head with a hollow clonk. Not so funny when the thing he's supposed to be catching is you, in what is probably supposed to be a heartwarming moment of relationship building at the climax of a platforming puzzle, as you leap desperately away from a collapsing ledge and fall towards the adorable Mr. Touchy face with arms outstretched. The cinematic slow motion activates as he cranes his neck forwards and proceeds to heroically, gormlessly stare at you, confused that you didn't bring him a biscuit as you plummet past his nose to your death. I was this close to quitting in frustration after I lost half an hour trying to figure out how to make Bonzo dive into a pool and swim through an underwater tunnel. I'm sorry game, I can't seem to find the button for the dive down and swim through tunnel command. Perhaps it lies between the buttons for WAP with rolled up newspaper and administer worming tablet on the controller that doesn't exist. But I did push through and was eventually able to enjoy the inevitable heartstring tugging ending, although the effectiveness was somewhat lessened by it, like the ending of Ico, hinging on us having grown invested in the relationship between boy and non-boy entity. While that was easier in Ico because Yorda was about as helpless as the last chicken nugget on a popular buffet table and we'd spent the last eight hours trying to keep her from skipping nonchalantly into the mouths of passing tigers, Fluffy Wuff Barkington III felt more like part of the hazards, something we needed to work around rather than with. It'd be like getting invested in the relationship between the bloke from Shenmue and the bloke from Shenmue's forklift. Imagine that, the storybook romance between a cold piece of emotionless machinery and a forklift. What a year it's been. Explosive elections, more celebrity deaths than a terrorist bombing at a drug rehab clinic, and a slew of game releases that ran the entire spectrum of awful, bland and grudgingly okay. Hence the annual top and bottom five. Joined once again after last year's show-stopping, well, show-prolonging debut by the Mediocre Five, which to my mind is far more representative of the industry anyway. You'll find neither Call of Duty nor Battlefield on any of these lists, if only because it's getting too obvious. I could repeat that Call of Duty is crushingly mediocre, but I could more profitably use the time to smack myself on the forehead with the flat edge of a trowel. I have a rule to never allow into the top five a sequel that's only good because it's more of a thing I liked before, which is why you'll note a mysterious absence of Dark Souls 3 on this list. However, I'd hate to miss an opportunity to remind everyone that Dark Souls rules, so I'm giving fifth best spot to Salt and Sanctuary for reminding me of it. It's Dark Souls but 2D, and therefore much easier to push through a gap under a door. On the bland games list, meanwhile, more of the same sequels can come in, make themselves at home, settle into their favourite armchair and bore the grandkids to death as much as they want. So step up, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Deus Ex Human Revolution was Deus Ex but not as interesting or clever, and the developers of Mankind Divided apparently decided that what was bringing down its predecessor was that too much stuff happened in it. <laughs> 
I suppose the fact that the very first game I reviewed went straight into the bottom five should have been read as a bad omen for the year, more so than that fucking gorilla anyway. Devil's Third was monumentally stupid and apparently designed by a schizophrenic with vibrators for thumbs, but it shall only skate at the edges of the bottom five for at least being weird enough to briefly distract one from, say, a recent bereavement or loss of limb. <laughs> After Titanfall 1 dared to show its face on the full price bin with no proper story campaign, the fact that Titanfall 2's story campaign turned out actually surprisingly good somehow becomes all the more damning. Why'd you hide that light under a bushel, Titanfall 1? We've already got clunky multiplayer shooters up the arse, but the pile of decent narrative gameplay experiences barely reaches the ends of our bum hairs. Normally the bland games list is a place for the games that push no boats out and wallow in the basically functional like a toddler in a fully loaded nappy, but Quantum Break did innovate by hybridising a game with a linear TV show, so not so much pushing the boat out as dragging it up the beach and turning it over to project shitty sci-fi channel originals over the hull. I'd advise Remedy to just make films if that's all they're interested in, but I have a feeling they'd be kinda shit. <laughs> Fourth worst is the first of two entries today that I like to collectively call Nintendo's prolonged public suicide. But you know, I've slightly mellowed to Metroid Prime Federation Force of late. They just wanted to try something new, right? Make a game that isn't atmospheric like Metroid Prime, explorative like Metroid Prime, or helmed by the strong protagonist of Metroid Prime, but call it Metroid Prime anyway. That's innovative, I suppose, in the sense that the atomic bomb had some innovative ideas about civic restructuring. <laughs> An interesting loophole in my no lazy sequels to games I already like rule is that it doesn't apply to blatant rip-offs of games I already like, especially if it's a bit better than the game I already like. I'm talking about Stardew Valley. It's all the mind-numbing workaday, let's tentatively call it fun, of Harvest Moon, but bigger and on Steam. There's never been a better time to stand behind a cow and make highly suspicious thrusting motions. The second Nintendo game on the list only made it to third blandest, as the worst games list requires that I get at least slightly worked up, and the donut of my interest in Paper Mario games can only get heartlessly stamped on once or twice before all the jam has been squirted out. That's what you are, Paper Mario Color Splash. You are the last pathetic dribble that oozes from my once squirty donut. <laughs> I always thought games lay on a straight line spectrum, good games at the bell end, bad games at the pubes, and merely boring games in the veiny shaft, but it turns out sometimes boring can go so far that it comes out from the shaft and curves around to the pubes like a scrotum of ennui. Basically what I'm saying is that The Division is a phenomenally tedious ball sack, so unending and vast that if pressed against the face it could euthanise a vegetative spouse. <laughs> But let's get away from pure alcock metaphors and discuss a game about waving your long thing around so that it smacks into scantily dressed women. Fury, by no means a huge game, but big enough to do everything it needed to do. Full marks for the quirky and compelling characters, for challenging varied boss fights, and for pragmatically cutting out the usual bullshit that goes in between boss fights. No marks for spelling, though. Sometimes I feel like doing a top 5 most Ubisofty sandbox games as well, because if I were less restrained, it and the bland games list might end up interchangeable, but I decided I'd keep it to one, and that one is Far Cry Primal, this year's exemplar of Ubisoft sandbox blandness, now that The Division has moved to the big leagues. Reveal the terrain, collect bollocks and invade strongholds, then for a change of pace, invade the terrain, reveal your bollocks and collect someone to hold you strongly. <laughs> VR is still in its experimental phase, and like CD-ROMs in the 90s, that means breaking new ground in terribleness. And CD-ROMs didn't make you physically ill unless you wired the spinning mechanism to your chair by mistake. But Batman Arkham VR is a rare kind of terrible even disregarding that. 30 bucks for a Batman experience equivalent to gluing Batman comic panels to your spectacles and locking yourself in a port <laughs> So let's give Doom the best game trophy and give myself the England cricket team award for totally unsurprising results, but it was a generally shitty year, as George Michael fans will attest, and I'm not as enthused about Doom as I was with Undertale. I couldn't see myself sulkily ending a friendship with someone because they weren't moved to tears when the Doom Marine snapped off the Cyberdemon's left horn and shoved it up his icon of sin. Oh, how the internal debate raged as to whether this belonged in the worst or blandest list, but in the end, no passionate hatred can be sustained for a game in which you can spend ten minutes pruning a giant pillar of rock with your colourful piss stream and not be entirely sure of how you profited from the venture. No Man's Sky, more like no game. That wasn't your strongest attempt at wordplay, Yarts. No worries, I'll just patch something better in later. <laughs> But it takes something special to top the worst games list. Bugs, bad design and awful story are but single ineptitudes. When the game was obviously a bad idea at the concept stage, its eventual release requires a perfect sequence of bad decisions, or what physicists call a cock-up cascade. Homefront of the Revolution started with the idea of making a sequel to a wish fulfilment for assholes modern shooter, and the resultant cock-up cascade was like watching a chihuahua in a dog wheelchair trying to descend a spiral staircase.